Can you give me an update on Diablo? What update do you need except to close it down? In fact, nuclear plants are shutting down faster than new ones are being built. The nuclear industry is a death industry. It's a cancer industry. This is crazy. You are sitting on top of the nuclear weapon. Operating reactors are being shut down and replaced with solar and wind power backed up by natural gas and coal. Most of the ones that are kind of cute and cuddly, it's energy farming. There's the intermittency prop. You have to have some way of getting energy during those time periods that it's not available. During the day, we generate as much electricity as we can using solar. At night, and when it's cloudy, we use more natural gas. Each year, we probably get over 200 days of sunshine, but there's 165 more days without. As big as this solar plant is, it's not enough to meet our customers' needs. The plant operates 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. That's why we need natural gas. The result being higher, not lower, greenhouse gas emissions. I cannot believe you are shutting down an operating source of reliable, clean energy. We are headed in the wrong direction. I'd like to introduce you to the AP-1000. The AP-1000 plant is designed to meet the world's growing need for electricity. It's a pretty darn good reactor, and it might almost become economically competitive with fossil fuel if a strong learning curve is established in their manufacture and assembly. It has great passive safety features designed to survive a Fukushima-like loss of power to its cooling pumps. So how does Westinghouse explain this pressurized water reactor's passive safety system to the public? As the steam from the in-containment refueling water storage tank fills containment, pressure increases until a certain point is detected by the instrumentation and control system. Then the instrumentation and control system sends a signal to automatically open redundant air-operated valves. Welcome to the exciting world of nuclear industry communications. Hello, I'm Llewellyn King. I'm executive producer and host of White House Chronicle on PBS. And I've been writing about nuclear power in Washington for um, nearly 50 years. I, I was kind of surprised looking at the communication of the AP-1000, how it didn't seem like it was trying to, uh, uh, to appeal to a mass audience. They fear if there's any hint that if you say, hey, there's a better reactor here, the new all-wheel drive, all-leather seats reactor has arrived, that caused doubt on the predecessors that are still in operation. The light water industry, the industry we have, uh, is very defensive. It has really, it serves the utilities, not the vendors, not the scientists, not the engineers, but the operators, the utilities. They are in the catbird seat. They control uh, the general view expressed by the nuclear industry. And they're timid. They don't want to say nuclear is better than coal, it's cleaner than natural gas because they have a lot of sunk investment in coal and because they're buying natural gas very cheaply. They never want to be put in the classic advertising situation of saying, this is better, we are moving ahead, this is superior. The valves allow water to flow by gravity from the passive containment cooling water storage tank located on top of the shield building to provide additional cooling of the steel containment vessel. Are they trying to tell us the AP-1000 is a particularly safe reactor? I'd also like to introduce you to Dr. Helen Caldicott. An AP-1000, which is still a light water reactor like the ones you have here, but it's cheaper because it's got less steel and less concrete in it, and it's called an eggshell reactor. <laughs> in the industry, so it could easily have an accident, it's very dangerous. She's a prominent anti-nuclear activist and funded the author of this thorium-dismissing report. I think you should not put nuclear energy on the table. It sucks the air out of the energy policy discussion. She uses debunked, fabricated visuals to sell books. Well, they'll be dying of cancer, but they're not dying from lack of electricity. They might be sweating a bit in the summer. 
Oh, but you mustn't be too hot in the summer. That's what we've got sweat glands for. And to scare people into protesting operating reactors. And the industry has never, ever called her out on it. In Seattle, the ambient levels of radiation went up 40,000 times above normal. And I've got a, um, a few slides. This is the fallout from Fukushima. Ambient levels of radiation in Seattle went up 40,000 times. This was released by the Australian Radiation Service, which has actually come to pass. So here's Japan, and here are you. And the ambient levels of radiation in Seattle went up 40,000 times above normal. The ambient levels in, in Seattle went up 40,000 times above normal. Because of this, Dr. Helen Caldicott knows she can say whatever she wants with no regard for the truth. Parts of Tokyo are extremely radioactive. Nuclear power produces massive quantities of global warming gas. There are wild boar in uh, Germany that almost glow in the dark. But 40% of the food probably in Europe is radioactive. More people have died from Chernobyl than in the Black Plague. Do you think that the industry should debunk people that are less credible? I think that when somebody makes false statements about nuclear, uh, that's when you need to address those statements specifically. And in some cases, you need to uh, demonstrate why the person who made the statement has no credibility. A number of people are making false claims and they're not getting challenged. What's with the nuclear industry that they don't do that? They don't care, they don't have to. Big nuclear is going to survive and as a matter of fact it's going to flourish. The industry has a philosophy of as long as nobody's thinking about us, that's a good thing. Uh, they like to do their job quietly and uh, hope for the best. Look at what Westinghouse is doing in China. They have, to my knowledge, four AP-1000s being built right now, another 12 on order. Maybe China's going a little fast, but also the Chinese government is acutely aware of its pollution. It doesn't like nuclear power. Nuclear energy is a kind of energy. It is safe. People of the city make the life better because all your under the coal is a limited source. We had better not to use the coal. Uh, industry cannot get much energy from the sun. And China is a big country and so nuclear power is necessary. There were some Eskimos, Inuits, and they had their normal life and they dried their fish and plaited the, the leather and hunted the polar bears and lived in their igloos and then they got electricity and then they got television and then the young men and women left to go to a better life and their life was destroyed. That's what I'm talking about. I was in China in 88. There wasn't a single car. There were millions of bicycles. There was one tall building in Beijing and I said, if China goes the way of America and they all get refrigerators and cars, we've had it. There are people who are really using very, very little material and very, very little energy. They are so green and they are so eager to stop being that kind of green. The main economic and demographic event in the world now is people are getting the hell out of poverty. Wires everywhere because they need electricity to do all the stuff that means being part of a city. How can I change this distribution so that most of this energy is being generated by non-carbon emitting sources? And then furthermore, how can I grow the pie itself so that other people in the world can enjoy energy at something a whole lot closer to a Western lifestyle? Because most of the world, especially the developing world, would love to have these things. And frankly, I think we should want them to have these things. People always talk about China's consumption of energy in the emission of the CO2 as the largest quantity of the world. China export. The consumption of the energy in China is not, not, not only for China, but for the, for the world. But in, in US, not only per capita wise, the, the highest energy consumption country, but also the advantage of other country to make import the goods energy consumed in other country rather than in the U.S. A lot of the energy used here in China is not for consume, it's for production.
lot of energy consumption. It's an unbelievably optimized process. There's not the same room for improvement, which is largely industrial processes. This is a 200 ton electric arc furnace. The main power source for the furnace is electricity. And so each furnace at max power is about 105 megawatts. I think it would unleash a lot of human potential that's currently not being fully ful fulfilled. Standards of living does correlate quite well with access to energy. Throughout her life, she had been heating water with firewood, and she had hand-washed laundry for seven children. And now she was going to watch electricity do that work. There's a great talk on TED by Hans Rosling of how women having, in the 50s, when they started to have washing machines, became suddenly hugely more productive. To my grandmother, the washing machine was a miracle. Washing clothes is a really unproductive task. It's just repetitive to keep doing it. You know, you're not creating anything that's sustaining anyone, really. It's just time wasted. So two billions have access to washing machine, and the remaining five billion, how do they wash? How do most of the women in the world wash? They wash like this, by hand. It's a time-consuming labor, hours every week. And sometimes they also have to bring water from far away. And they want the washing machine. And there's nothing different in their wish than it was for my grandma. Two generations ago in Sweden, water from the stream, heating with firewood, washing like that. They want the washing machine in exactly the same way. But environmentally concerned students tell me, no, everybody in the world cannot have cars and washing machines. How many of you doesn't use a car? And some of them proudly raise their hand, you know, and say, I don't use a car. And then I put the really tough question. How many of you hand wash your jeans and your bed sheet? And no one raised their hand. As soon as you could get a machine to do that for you, that time became time for the family. And he said that was when he sat down with his mum and started to learn to read with her. And that would happen multiplied over. All these women suddenly have much more capacity for being more nurturing or being more productive. And it's a great empowerer to have energy and have machines do things for us that are just routine, rote tasks. Huge fractions of the developing world. Women spend all day looking for sources of water. And when they get to the water, it is typically filthy and parasites, disease, etc. I mean, if you could have clean water, uh, disease and parasite-free water to homes, you would liberate an enormous amount of time. And you'd increase the health of the people. Uh, there's a lot of things we just throw away because the energy to reuse them is more expensive than virgin material. Dig it out of the ground, you turn it into something, you use it, you smash it, and then you throw it back in a pit in the ground. Ultimately, it just means you leave one big hole in the ground over here and then start filling up another hole over there, and is that is that sustainable perhaps as a more of a closed loop system that could be employed? And that's the dream, but that does require energy. That was one thing that always attracted me about the notion of exploring space, was that you had to implement that simply to survive. You know, if you were gonna live on the moon or Mars, there was no pit over here and pit over there. You better figure out how to make it all stay. You know, every, every atom of nitrogen or oxygen or hydrogen became precious to you. And when I would tell people, why were we doing NASA? That was the most effective thing, was the whole idea of recycling and what we would learn from exploring space. What prevents us from doing that right now on Earth? I mean, why do we have to go to space to learn how to be really, really good recyclers? Why don't we recycle like that on Earth? It's energy, you know, energy has to be really, really cheap or the penalty has to be really, really bad. Now in space, the penalty was really, really bad. If you didn't recycle, you ran out of air and water. But on the ground, to go achieve that dream of a closed loop, you need to have really, really cheap energy. For example, in the copper mining space, when they extract the copper, they'll do a first pass and then leave it as a mound. And they'll wait until the price of copper goes high enough. But there's a price at which you can justify doing a second or even third or more passes and it's all a function of what's the energy input and what's the market price. And when those reach parity, you can go in and, and justify more extraction. Well, the same is true with recycling these materials. If we can bring the cost of electricity down far enough, you could conceivably even go back and, and recycle landfills. 
workers, appliances, uh, we chop up rail, old rail cars, uh, demolish bridges, buildings, um, whatever. We load scrap into large haul trucks and they back up into this bucket and dump scrap inside. That's dozens of cars. Yeah, a lot of cars. So that bucket probably has 140 tons of scrap in it right now. I told them if they saw anything go boom and run behind you, yeah. that's still the standard protocol. That's right, I got Kevlar on. All right, you guys do the same, we're all getting behind you. So you've been able to drop your power consumption per ton almost about a third, it looks like. Probably since the, uh, the mid, early 80s. So besides your scrap material input, what's your next largest cost on production? Electricity. Electricity. How do you water use? We're evaporatively cooling. And we use about two and a half million gallons a day, so we're a pretty big water user which is about a tenth of what the paper mills use. But you can get far more cycles on recycling steel oh, or aluminum well, than you could out of paper or plastic. Oh, sure. Yeah, actually, it's debatable whether paper recycling is even that great a pursuit. In some cases, it's mandated, but this is one where economics drives the recycling. But the steel industry is probably one of the better models of recycling. Aluminum, too, would be. There's less given over to waste. If we could make energy cheap enough, there's a lot of other products you could Absolutely. make economic to recycle. Absolutely. It's easy to forget about that in our world here on Earth because we're so abstracted from our energy sources. Food is at the grocery store and that we flush the toilet and the waste goes somewhere where somebody takes care of them. And we don't really think about the, the flow of energy that makes all of this possible. With the energy generated, we can actually recycle all of the air, water, and waste products within the lunar community. In fact, doing so would be an absolute requirement for success. We could grow the crops needed to feed the members of the community even during the two-week lunar night using light and power from the reactor. It kind of was this microcosm that made it easier for me to understand the bigger picture that we do have going on here on Earth and how we can make that, that bigger picture better, how we can enhance our quality of life on Earth. When I think of our golden era of space exploration, the late 1950s right on up through the early 1970s, over that time, very few weeks would go by before there would be an article in a magazine where a cover story would extol the city of tomorrow. I mean, why wouldn't we want a community of the future to be self-sustaining and energy independent? The same energy generation and recycling techniques that can have a powerful impact on surviving on the moon could also have a powerful impact on surviving on the Earth. And people love that. They think you're naive to be optimistic, that we are going to make the future better than the past. We are going to figure out our problems, and we're going to get past them. What's your project? My project's on reducing carbon emissions, and I chose to do so with nuclear. And I talk a bit on the oil sands, on how nuclear can help, for example, generating the steam for SAG-D. In a week's time, if both fires are growing, we'll probably use more electricity than the city of Chicago will use in a year. Yep. Wow. In fact, one of the things that we've been chasing is, you know, we've got all this waste heat, but it's the nature of it that doesn't lend itself very well to, you know, throwing in a conventional Rankin cycle somewhere. In theory, back of the napkin kind of stuff, maybe we could recover another 20 or 30 megawatts out of the 200 we're sharing between these two furnaces. So as we probably captured 90% of what's to be captured, chasing the last 10% is pretty expensive. Most people don't understand everything you look at, touch, feel, anything is tangible. There's energy behind it, a lot of it. Don't eat any Japanese food. No seaweed, no miso, no fish, nothing. I know Japanese food is that. I went to a restaurant in New York the other day, sushi restaurant. People bring me sake and girls all dressed up and their big shoes that they wear these days and everything. <laughs> and I said, where did the fish come from? Oh, they said Japan. So I got fish from New Zealand. I mean, you got the, the same people that demand fresh fish be flown in from Alaska in cold storage. They're the ones that, oh, we got to have wind power. We got to have all these all these options that aren't viable. So, yeah, that's uh, a frustration we felt in this industry. So we saw the other day how electrical power was used to make steel from recycled materials. You know, those operations couldn't proceed if they thought in two hours they might or might not have power. They would not be able to make steel that way. They have to have reliable energy sources. Well, Mozart and, and Shakespeare wrote by candlelight. Ooh, candlelight. 
I'm writing an article for the International Herald Tribune now about the future of nuclear power, and I ended it by saying that and said, and they, the editor wrote back and said, well, you don't want to encourage people to think they have to go to candlelight again. Well, what's wrong with candlelight? That's right. That's right. The World Health Organization has concluded fossil fuel air pollution kills more than three and a half million people per year. That's 10,000 people per day. 10,000 people is more than have been killed by nuclear power in the history of the planet. You know, so we have to, we have to be objective in comparing the environmental impacts of uh, different energy sources. Until I heard about thorium and began learning about nuclear power, I had no idea nuclear power was carbon free. We have to phase out carbon emissions at a rate of several percent a year. I don't see any way we can do that without the help of nuclear power. Nuclear power is essentially carbon free energy. And until I fact check Caldecott's dismissal of thorium, educate your friends and get the word out about thorium. I had no idea how much misinformation had been propagated. As James Hansen says at NASA, the godfather of global warming, we've got to stop burning coal now. Germany has now decided that 80% of its energy is going to come from renewables shortly. You know, the country can be totally re converted to renewables within a year, if you've got the guts. As James Hansen says at NASA, the godfather of global warming, we've got to stop burning coal now. The people who argue for all renewables think that, well, if we can go from 0% to 10% to 20% renewable, then we're on the way and then it will get easier and we'll get 100%. Well, it's actually, if you look at the engineering, it's actually the opposite. When you get to 20 or 30%, then it gets harder, not easier, because of the intermittency of the renewables. We haven't produced very many nuclear engineers. I taught a, a class of senior level engineer students at Tennessee Tech in the fall of 2010, and there were 13 in the class. And, you know, they didn't even have nuclear engineering at Tennessee Tech. These were all mechanicals, electricals, chemicals. Um, five of them went on to grad school in nuclear engineering because of my course. I wanted to like write the NRC and say, You've told them the best situation you can possibly have is to be part of a massive decommissioning contract. I mean, how many people want to spend their careers doing that? When a nation dreams big and has fully funded projects visible to everyone, where a, a, a frontier is getting advanced daily, innovations attract smart, clever people. The, the, the prospect of innovation attracts them. Everyone feels like tomorrow is something they want to invent and bring into the present. You, know, you guys should elect an engineer president. You know, that's, that's what Chinese do. The China, you know, all our political leaders are lawyers and all of China's political leaders are engineers. <laughs> so, oh gosh. We're going broke. We're mired in debt. We don't have as many scientists as we want or need and jobs are going overseas. I assert that these are not isolated problems, that they're the collective consequence of the absence of ambition that consumes you when you stop having dreams. If all you do is coast, Eventually, you slow down while others catch up and pass you by. 1994, the state of California passed the law of the zero emissions. And GM's EV1 came out in 1996 because they want very much like to catch the market of the California. The big oils heavily lobbying East Coast not to follow the same track as California did. Finally, GM called back all the EV1s from the market and crash them in 2004. It's, 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 it's something to me like, like, like World War II, NAS. It's amazing, it's, it's very scary story here. Here is pure electrical car developed by Chinese Academy of Sciences. We used to have a dream, if we can produce a clean electricity, then we can drive our electrical car. However, if you look at this, 
as of today, it, it's all gasoline cars. So it makes our job even impossible. We need a revolutionary something happen. Nuclear power plants are capable of much more than producing marginally competitive baseload electricity. So what can they do? Let's return to first principles and then re-examine what it is the human race needs in order to thrive with minimal impact on our environment. Let's take a peek at a future powered by nuclear. This is a little weird. We can radically cut climate change emissions and leave a safe, clean world to the future. We don't need to invent anything new. We just need to stop wasting time with distractions like nuclear power. Come on, let's build the future we all want to see. To understand why nuclear power has so much potential requires some effort. It requires you to exercise a little bit of study. Which part of this is doable and could be safe and could be acceptable in our society and which part of this is not? And there's a collage of images that the anti-nuclear movement will throw at you, usually of nuclear weapons. I hate nuclear weapons. I never want to see nuclear weapons used. I have no interest in that. But I do want to see nuclear power used to make my life and my children's lives and your children's lives safer and better. Think of the sun's heat on your upturned face on a cloudless summer's day. From 150 million kilometers away, we recognize its power. When's the last time you watched Cosmos with Carl Sagan? Recently, actually. Really? Yeah, I, I showed it to my kids a couple of years ago. Uh, Empire Strikes Back and Cosmos were probably two of my formative influences at the age of six. The sun is the nearest star, a glowing sphere of gas. The surface we see in ordinary visible light is at 6,000 degrees centigrade. But in its hidden interior, Super hot gas pushes the sun to expand outward. At the same time, the sun's own gravity pulls it inward to contract at a stable equilibrium between gravity and nuclear fire. Atoms are made in the insides of stars. The atoms are moving so fast that when they collide, they fuse. Helium is the ash of the sun's nuclear furnace. The sun is a medium-sized star, its core is only a lukewarm 10 million degrees. Hot enough to fuse hydrogen, but too cold to fuse helium. There are many stars in the galaxy, more massive yet, that live fast and die young in cataclysmic supernova explosions. Those explosions are far hotter than the core of the sun, hot enough to transform elements like iron into all the heavier ones and spew them into space. Long before the Earth, our home was built. Stars brought forth its substance. Our planet, our society, and we ourselves are built of star stuff. Now, two of the things that were created in supernova are thorium and uranium. These were different because they were radioactive and they kept some of that energy from the supernova explosion stored in their very nuclear structure. And some of this thorium and uranium was incorporated into our planet, sinking to the center of the world and heating our planet. Liquid iron circulating around the solid part of the core as Earth rotates acts like a wire carrying an electric current. Electric currents produce magnetic fields, and that's a good thing. Our magnetic field protects us from the onslaught of cosmic rays. Bigger deal, the magnetic field is deflecting the solar wind. If you don't have a magnetic field deflecting the solar wind, over billions of years your planet ends up like Mars because the solar wind will strip off a planet's atmosphere without the protecting nature of the magnetic field. So if we didn't have the energy from thorium inside the Earth, we would be on a dead planet. The decay of radioactive elements in the core keeps it moving. Let's talk about radioactivity because I had an erroneous notion of what radioactivity was. I thought that if you had something that had like a half-life of a day and you had something that had a half-life of a million years, it meant that the dude that was radioactive for a day is like for a day and then oh, I'm done. And the dude who's half-life for a million years is like for a million years and then done. Okay, so you go, well, which one of these is more dangerous? Well, definitely the one that's got a half-life of a million years because that's got to be like radioactive forever and the dude that's radioactive for a day, that's not a big deal, right? Completely wrong. Okay, utterly backwards. 
the dude who's radioactive for a day is really, really radioactive. The dude who's radioactive for a million years is hardly radioactive at all. Which one of those two is more dangerous? The one that's radioactive for a day, by a long shot. Okay, so your radioactivity is directly and inversely proportional to your half-life. So somebody goes to you, there's something that's got half-life a million years. Scary, huh? And you give it to me, I'll put it in my hand. It's not gonna hurt me, it's not gonna hurt me. This is a half-life of a day. You want to hold? No, no, keep it away from me, man. That stuff is hot. But it's going away fast, too, right? It's got a longer half-life. It's less dangerous. And I want to tear my hair out because what I haven't mentioned is radioactive waste. It's all our radioactive waste. The main problem is radioactive waste. Close down all those reactors now with solar and wind and geothermal. Geothermal. What's green energy? And they go, geothermal's green energy. Okay. Do you know where geothermal comes from? No. It comes from decay of thorium inside the earth. Oh. Is geothermal renewable? Yes. Okay, then thorium's renewable. No, it's not. You're using it up. Well, you're using up thorium as it decays inside the earth. Any argument for geothermal, if it is rigorously pursued, is an argument for the renewability of thorium as an energy resource. The majority of American geothermal is harvested in the state of California, which has most of its geothermal energy harvested in the Imperial Valley. A typical Imperial Valley geothermal plant produces 40 tons of radioactive waste every day. They're, they're saddled with all our radioactive waste. Who do we think we are, Bob? Geothermal is creating 200 times the volume of radioactive waste that nuclear reactors do per watt of power. I don't want to wear a dose of meter. Don't want to calculate and sievers. I don't want to see no clean-up crew. Or get sapped before I hear the news. We can get the heat from Earth and Sun. Put the wind to make the engines run. Common sense could only start a chain reaction of the human heart. What a wonderful world this would be. Coal and gas plants are able to release radioactive materials to the environment in much greater amounts than a nuclear plant would ever possibly be allowed to because they are considered uh, what's called NORM, naturally occurring radioactive materials. For instance, when you go frack a shale and you pull gas out, a lot of radon comes out with that too. You burn the gas, that radon's being released. Nobody counts that radon against the gas. If they did, <laughs> the regulatory commission would shut the gas, gas plant down. Same with coal. And they've spent a lot of money to make sure that regulatory agencies do not regulate NORM uh, for a, goal, a coal or a gas plant the way they regulate radioactive emissions from a nuclear plant. If they did, we would be shutting down all our coal and gas plants based on radioactivity alone. A fear of radiation probably is the basis of most fear of nuclear power in general. What is radiation? It's simply the idea that, that there are certain nuclei that radiate things from them. In the process of changing to something else, they radiate something. Modern physics and chemistry have reduced the complexity of the sensible world to an astonishing simplicity. Three units put together in different patterns make essentially everything. A proton has a positive electrical charge. A neutron is electrically neutral. And an electron, an equal, negative electrical charge. Since every atom is electrically neutral, the number of protons in the nucleus must equal the number of electrons far away in the electron cloud. The protons and neutrons together make up the nucleus of the atom. If you're an atom and you have just one proton, you're hydrogen. Two protons, helium, three lithium, all the way to 92 protons, in which case, your name is uranium. For any given element, the number of protons must remain the same, but the number of neutrons may vary. The atomic weight of an atom is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Natural uranium may contain 142, 143, or 146 neutrons. That means uranium has three natural isotopes. 
U-234, U-235, and U-238. Some elements, such as tin, have a great number of natural isotopes. Others, such as aluminum, have only one. Most isotopes are stable. They would never spontaneously change their atomic structure. But some isotopes are constantly changing. They're busy being radioactive. Given enough time, this radium-88 isotope will shed energy and change. This is how isotopes in the Earth itself emit radiation. The Geiger counter detects their presence. A cloud chamber makes these rays visible to the naked eye. Each new vapor trail shows that another atom has thrown off a fragment from its nucleus. Each atom does this only once before becoming a different isotope. This activity appears to go on endlessly. That's because there's billions of atoms in that tiny sample. You can't turn decay on and off. If we can turn radioactive decay on and off, we could do all kinds of things, but we've never figured out how to do it. I don't think we ever will, because we simply can't influence the state of the nucleus like that. Hit it with a hammer. Boil it in oil. Vaporize it. The nucleus of an atom is a kind of sanctuary, immune to the shocks and upheavals of its environment. The atoms of each unstable element decay at a constant rate. These mousetraps represent atoms that are radioactive. Every once in a while, a mousetrap spring breaks down and snaps shut. A tiny bit of mass is converted into energy as an atom changes spontaneously into a lighter isotope. Thorium has only one isotope, thorium-232. It has a 14 billion year half-life. Okay, so when the universe is twice as old as it is now, thorium will have only decayed one half-life. So based on what I just told you about radioactivity, what does that tell you about how radioactive thorium is? Not Hardly at all. Okay, uranium, two isotopes, uranium-235, uranium-238, both of course are radioactive. U-238 has a five billion year half-life. That's pretty old, that's about how old the Earth is. That's how old the Earth is, that's how old the universe is. Uranium-235 on the other hand, much shorter half-life, 700 million years. This is a handful of these uranium oxide fuel pellets. And you can see the picture, the guy's got gloves on, and it's easy to think, oh, he's got gloves on to protect him from the uranium oxide. But now that I've taught you about the true nature of radioactivity, you might go, ah, Kirk, I'm not so sure that stuff's so dangerous after all. And you would be correct. He's not protecting himself from the uranium, he's protecting the uranium from himself. That stuff has to stay super pure and super clean, and you don't want to get any of your oils or grease or sweat on nuclear fuel that's going to go inside side a fuel rod, so that's what the gloves are for. Knowing that some atoms could spontaneously change, in 1939, scientists tried firing a neutron into the nucleus of a uranium atom, the heaviest and least stable atom found in nature. Instead of a minor change from one isotope into another, the uranium atom split into two parts. When an atom is so unstable that it can be split into two by hitting it with a neutron, we call that fissile. When the fissile uranium atom split apart, those two parts combined were lighter than the original uranium atom. The missing mass was converted into energy. Also released were two neutrons. One free neutron has become two free neutrons. Now we have two neutrons. This implied a nuclear chain reaction in uranium. Obviously, that's not what we want to do in reactors. Most reactors are completely incapable of sustaining that kind of neutron multiplication. So you reach a point where only one fission is causing another fission, and that is the notion of criticality. It's a state of balance. When you want to bring a reactor up to power, you bring it to supercriticality to a certain level. You go up till you get to where you want to be, and then you level out at criticality. And one of the things I had wondered about for the longest time was it seems like this is such a precise balance. How would it be possible in an engineered machine to attain such an absolute 
perfect situation of balance. And what I found in my great interest was the negative temperature coefficient of reactivity. The reactor will become more reactive as it gets cooler and less reactive as it gets hotter. This notion of a chain reaction has perhaps been used a number of times to uh, perhaps scare people about how nuclear fission reactions really take place in a reactor as if they are an uncontrolled expansion of the number of fission events. That's not really what happens in a reactor. Somebody wondered one time, okay, billions of years ago, that means there was a lot more uranium-235 and natural nuclear reactors might have been possible. When you generate electricity from nuclear power, you make 200 new elements that never existed before we fissioned uranium. We found in Africa, at a place called Oklo in the Gabon, two billion years ago, there were scores of natural nuclear reactors there. There were nothing more than uranium ore in the rock and the water would come in and it would lead to a nuclear reaction. And these reactors ran for hundreds of millions of years. So we did not invent nuclear fission. All right, it was done long, long, long before we were here and very successfully. Back when the Earth was formed, there was a lot more uranium-235 than there is now. Uranium-235 is like silver and platinum. Your uranium in Saskatchewan is so rich you don't even have to enrich it. It's, it's extremely powerful. Caldecott is wrong. There is no natural source of isotopically enriched uranium. Natural uranium's isotopic ratios are identical everywhere on Earth. The amount of uranium in the world is finite. If all electricity today was generated with nuclear power, there would only be nine years supply of uranium left in the whole world. In reality, there is no more a constrained uranium supply than there is a constrained seawater supply. Uranium is water soluble and it passes from the Earth's mantle to the crust to the ocean Every year, the ocean contains more uranium than the previous year. What Caldecott refers to as a nine-year supply of uranium is in fact an infinite supply. Harvesting uranium from seawater is impractically expensive today, but that will undoubtedly change should our uranium mines ever be exhausted. I'm offering you to drill on one of the great undeveloped fields of Little Boston. Those areas have been drilled. Oh, yeah. My straw reaches across the room. We're pretty inventive when it comes to harvesting natural resources. I drink your milkshake. I drink it up. We are never going to run out of uranium. It is quite literally a renewable resource. For all the difference that distinction makes. We need to have uh, a realization that we've got a, about 35 years worth of oil left in the whole world. We're going to run out of oil. I'm and they're, I'm they're I'm saddled with all our radioactive waste. Who do we think we are, Bob? And I want to tear my hair out because what I haven't mentioned is radioactive waste. The main problem is radioactive waste. When you don't use materials efficiently, you make waste. You make material that should have been used as a fuel and rather ends up as a waste. You have some fissile nuclei. That means this is a nucleus that if you hit it with a neutron, the nucleus begins to distend and a piece comes off. And the smaller piece is about 30 or 40 percent the original mass of the nucleus. And the larger fission product is basically what was left over. And so what this leads to a, a double humped distribution in the masses of the fission products. On this table, you see the smaller fission product highlighted in yellow and then the heavier fission product highlighted in green. And then there's this gap for a while where there are things that simply are not made by fission. Uh, tungsten, gold, mercury, none of those are made by fission. And then when you get to thallium, now you're getting to what's called the decay products. These are not formed by fission. They're formed when you leave uranium and thorium and plutonium alone for you know, hundreds or thousands of years, they will decay into these products. And those are shown in this chart in uh, a pink color. And then there is what's called the transuranics. That's what happens when the uranium absorbs the neutron and doesn't fission. It turns into plutonium and americium and curium and a few others. Most of it's plutonium. I mean, the overwhelming majority of transuranics are plutonium. You get a lot of different things from fission, but you don't get everything. And that's significant. It's not as if you're dumping the whole periodic table out when you, when you make fission. You get certain elements in, in a preponderance and you get some very rarely and you get some not at all, for instance. 
You can't make gold from fission. When we first load nuclear fuel in a uranium-fueled reactor, it is entirely uranium, and most of that is uranium-238. As it burns down, first at a year, two years, and then three years, you see the formation of other things. These are the fission products, as well as some of the transuranics. The hatch at the bottom gives away the fact that most of the rod is still uranium-238. The overwhelming majority is still this unburned uranium-238. Still, most of that potential energy remains to be exploited. In fact, the only fraction that has been truly burned is the fraction you see kind of in those light pastel colors. Those are the fission products. But the remainder of the material is unrealized energy. Xenon is the most common of the fission products. And here is Xenon-135, its cross-section relative to two nuclear fuels. Okay, see these little bitty guys? So imagine we're playing darts or something and throwing them. Which one are we going to hit here? I mean, we're going to hit the big red dot. When Xenon-135 forms from fission, it really wants to eat your neutron. They're called fission products. They're the product of fission. You split an atom, you got smaller atoms. That can poison the fuel itself and kill fission, unless the poisons can come out of the fuel. This turns out to be a big problem for real nuclear reactors. This was one of the first reactors that was ever built. This was the Hanford reactor. They turned it on, and everything seemed to be going. And after about a day or two of running it, all of a sudden the power went and dropped, like almost to zero. And they left it alone, and after about you know, 12, 18 hours, all of a sudden it went and it came back up to power again, and it held there. And they're like, what? And then pretty soon it goes, pew, and it drops off again. They're going, this makes no sense. We're not doing anything. The thing's like turning on, and it's turning off, and it's turning on, and it's turning off. Well, what was going on was the reactor would turn on, and xenon-135 would begin to build up. And as it built up, it would start eating all those neutrons, right? And then it pew, and it would take the reactor back down again. And then after a while, it would decay away. And once it decayed away, the reactor would come back on again. So it was following this up and down effect. Just crazy. I mean, these guys didn't even know what Xenon-135 was, because this was like one of the first nuclear reactors ever built. This actually was a contributing effect to the Chernobyl disaster, was the presence of, of Xenon-135. NASA uses Xenon to throw out the backside of an ion engine. We used to joke at NASA that Xenon was one of the few things worth launching into space because it actually cost about as much as it cost to put up in space. One man's waste is another man's treasure. And it doesn't take a lot of thought. Come up with clever ways of utilizing that waste. You can help a lot of people and you can monetize that waste. And you can do it safely, and you can do it, in some cases, for very strategic reasons. By extracting the first four fission products, xenon, neodymium, zirconium, and molybdenum, right away you've reduced the waste stream considerably. What about the rest? The two troublemakers are strontium and cesium, but even those two could have very useful applications. Strontium-90 could be fabricated into little heating modules. Cesium-137 could be used to irradiate food. Food irradiation does not cause the food to become radioactive. That doesn't happen. But by irradiating strawberries or lettuce or other leafy vegetables, uh, you can kill E. coli, and E. coli does kill people. In fact, kills a lot of people each year. Think of your home, think of your pantry. Now imagine taking everything out of your pantry and pouring it on the floor. So your sugar and your cornflakes and your flour and your baked beans and you know everything is in a big pile on the floor. How valuable is that giant mix to you? It's not valuable at all. It's worthless. It's completely worthless. What, all you do is you'd shovel it up and you throw it in the trash. What makes the stuff in your pantry valuable is the fact that it is separated. The sugar's in one container and the flour's in another and your cornflakes are in another altogether. So what we've got with nuclear waste is we've got that pile of everything mixed together. Almost every one of those things is useful, isolated and separated from everything else. I might show you some uh, slides. What really is in a nuclear reactor? Barium, lanthanum, cerium, presidium, ne neo, I can't pronounce that. That's the most important slide you're going to see tonight. And that's what nobody knows. It started in the 40s as a result of nuclear fission, as a result of splitting of the atoms, you got a lot of rare earth elements. We literally had atomic level control over this and we studied the hell out of them. The idea of splitting matter and of creating other particles, you're getting into a lot of alchemical realms 
that I think that starts bumping into a lot of people's religious fears. We have to have humility and understand who we are and then we're not. We're not God. We're, we're just fallible human beings who make mistakes and therefore we must eradicate all things nuclear. Ne Neo, I can't pronounce that. Prometheum, Samarium, Europium. They name them, a lot of them after themselves, these physicists. Ganolinium, I can't, terbutium, terbium, terbium, dysprosium, holmium, thalumium, luten, lutenium, hafnium, tantalum, I don't know, tungsten. <sighs> what might we use these for? Maybe they're so exotic, they'll just be curiosities. We've been there before. That was said of most of the elements that were discovered on the periodic table. For example, who would have thought an obscure semi-metal, germanium, discovered in the 1880s, would turn out to be the crucial ingredient in the development of transistors? That 70 years later. Neodymium and samarium, regarded for a century as just curiosities, they turned out to be essential to the construction of super powerful permanent magnets. Whatever they put this waste in, it's so hot and radioactive, be it glass, ceramics, metal, or whatever, will start to disintegrate within 10 years. The main problem is radioactive waste. Americium, Einsteinium, Neptunium, Plutonium. 236 pins or tubes that have the fuel pellets in them that make up a, fu a fuel assembly, and there are 241 fuel assemblies that make up the reactor fuel load. Nuclear waste is mixed together because it is all chopped together in solid fuel rods. And if rods break, it, they will release argon, krypton, xenon, cesium, radioactive iodine, and all sorts of things. The scariest way to describe nuclear waste is to describe its total tonnage and then list the most dangerous things contained within. Because nuclear waste contains hundreds of different isotopes, this is a list from which anti-nuclear campaigners can choose from, like a menu at a restaurant. How radioactive is nuclear waste? As radioactive as the isotope with the shortest half-life. How long-lasting is nuclear waste? As the isotope with the longest half-life. Let's go and have a look at some. In the mid-90s, the Connecticut Yankee Power Station was decommissioned. And here, what you can see is the entire load of spent fuel from 28 years of operations. That produced in its lifetime from a small nuclear reactor 110 million megawatt hours of electricity with no greenhouse gas emissions. And that's every bit of fuel that was required to do it is sitting there in storage, quietly, happily, causing no one any problems. And I'm sure you'll agree that that's a pretty small facility. Let's just have a look at it in the context of the landscape. It's a pretty place, Connecticut, surrounded by state parks. What you see there that is the source of decades of anti-nuclear fear-mongering on the basis of spent nuclear fuel. That's it. That's what we've been told to be afraid of. We've been told by generations of anti-nuclear activists to build up in our minds this into such a fearful monster that we have to reject it at all costs, even if the cost might be a habitable climate. Now, I'm not afraid of it. Do you know what I see when I look at it? I see another 10 billion megawatt hours of electricity because that fuel is just waiting to be recycled and reused in a fast reactor. Out in the desert in Idaho are the Argonne National Laboratories. You can see the experimental breeder reactor too. There's the reactor building and directly attached to it is the fuel recycling facility. So the so-called nuclear waste we have sitting in places like Connecticut in that we have the most staggeringly large quantity of clean fuel. We've already mined it. The rods generate energy by transforming some of the uranium into different elements. Fission products start to build up. We need chemistry to separate them out. But since the fission products are thoroughly mixed with the uranium, pyroprocessing, a nifty technology invented by argon scientists. The thing is, they call it pyroprocessing, but it's a molten salt process. They're dissolving this thing in a molten salt, and they're doing electrochemistry on it. After chopping the fuel rods into small pieces, you submerge them in a vat of molten salts. 
when you run an electric current through the vat, the uranium and transuranics separate out and forms crystals on the electrodes. Molten salt can not only be a fuel, it's a way to reprocess or process nuclear fuels and clean them up for reuse. So the entrepreneur in me says, hey, wait a second, let's go grab those fuel rods and let's go make money off of them. I know that I can save lives by using those isotopes. I know that I can make money and better society with those isotopes. There's enough energy trapped inside those spent fuel rods to power the entire planet for decades. All the ash that builds up from the burning of coal, they put it in a big pile. It's called a tailings pile. Well, no break this week for crews in Tennessee trying to clean up that mess of potentially toxic sludge that oozed across hundreds of acres of land just west of Knoxville. Crews are using heavy equipment to clear away sludge that inundated a neighborhood near Harriman, Tennessee. 5.4 million cubic yards. Coal ash residue that comes from burning coal to create electricity at the power plant that is run by the Tennessee Valley Authority. Authority. That ash is now entered into the neighborhood, entered into the land, and most importantly, into two rivers here in the Tennessee River watershed. In that ash are heavy metals like lead, mercury, cadmium, and arsenic. You can see the ash. See, they're still digging it. Oh, man, look at that. Four years later, still working on it. What did it spill from? It absorbs a lot of moisture, Gordon. When we had that big rainstorm, it actually took on a lot of water and held it to where the piles just collapsed and flowed downhill. You're seeing an ash pile washed down. I don't see an ash pile big enough where something... Well, that's because it's already washed, washed down. down. It used to be a mountain, and now it's just a big wash. Pretty much every coal plant has a huge ash tailings pile. This is not unique. They've all got them. This is, this is the, the waste of coal. I did some, some analysis in the UK coal stations. This one probably a bit small, but it's about a ton of CO2 every five seconds. This is my biggest worry. Not small quantities of contained nuclear waste, but mountains of low-level chemical waste, which can suddenly become toxic pollution. Or worse yet, the chemical pollution we dump directly into the oceans and the atmosphere. So it might not seem like it, but it's the middle of the day here in Beijing. The air is so polluted that it's darkened the sky. Waste is contained. Pollution is uncontained. It is air pollution, which kills millions of people each year, including thousands of Americans. It is air pollution, which increasingly traps the sun's energy. And it is air pollution that Germany continues to produce despite their staggeringly expensive deployment of intermittent energy sources. This is a democratically elected industrialized nation wasting billions of dollars. It can happen. During the height of Wednesday's blackout, fire crews had to free people trapped in elevators. The idea of playing elevator roulette may sound funny, but try living with it. Put yourself in the middle of California during the summer of 2000, when blackouts began to roll across the state. Sacramento, San Francisco, Beverly Hills, Long Beach, San Diego. The energy crisis would cost California $40 billion. For the second day in a row, not enough electricity for America's largest state and the world's sixth largest economy. I, I, I can feel for him. I was out of power four times this weekend for a total of over 10 hours. There simply wasn't enough electricity available. As the blackouts continued, there were competing narratives presented by the media one such narrative was, this is just an unusual heat wave. Generating capacity is going to catch up. Today we know there was much more to it than that. 
The first thing we heard about this energy crisis is where our lights are going to go off in the middle of winter when we're using half the electricity we normally use during the summer. We have an installed capacity in California at the time of 45,000 megawatts, plenty of power. We only need 28,000 to 30,000 megawatts in December. Of course, we had blackouts in December. The numbers just didn't add up. We had enough power in California. It was never about lack of supply. You know, talking about OPEC puts me in mind of a simpler time when the energy interests we were held hostage to were American ones. And given the complexity and dryness of the subject, it seemed impossible the charges could ever be proven, unless somehow somebody turned up some sort of smoking gun. Which brings us to last week. Hey, John. It's Tim. The regulatory is all in a big concern about is we're wheeling power out of California. Two Enron traders discuss a colleagal manipulation of the California power market. He just f***ed California. He steals money from California to the tune of about a million. Can we rephrase that? Okay, he, um, he, he arbitrages the California market to the tune of a million bucks or two a day. <laughs> um, Those greedy mother arbitragers. <laughs> Enron traders started to export power out of the state. I'll see you guys. I'm taking mine to the desert. When prices soared, they brought it back in. So we fucking export like a motherfucker. You get rich. I'm trying to. What are the permutations and combinations of ways to move power around the West? Traders would stay after a 12 hour shift and pour over maps of the Western energy grid. And I think that that's something that Enron knew better than any other energy marketer in the country, period. We know all of the California load. We know all of the California imports. By shutting down power plants, they could create artificial shortages that would push prices even higher. Hey, uh, this is David up at Enron. Uh-huh. There's not much uh, demand for power at all. And we're, if we shut it down, could you bring it back up in three or four hours? Okay. When you see 30, 35% of their entire capacity down for maintenance on a single day, the price of electricity skyrocketing three or 400%, you begin to believe something's not smelling right here. We're getting pretty spoiled, don't we? It's money. You're getting a little scared. We're making a little too much, and I, I tend to agree with you. <laughs> At the flip of a switch, could just yank the California economy on its leash whenever they wanted to, and they did it, and they did it, and they did it, and they made so much money. I want you guys to get a little creative okay. and come up with a reason to go down. Like a forced outage type thing. Right. An industry that went for 100 years from the days of Edison was very reliable, was all of a sudden turned into a casino. Can't treat electricity like you treat oranges. It's the lifeblood of society. There would be ample supply available at the right fucking price. They're taking all the money back from you guys? All the money you guys stole from those poor grandmothers of California? <laughs> yeah, Grandma Millie, man. Yeah, now she wants her money back for the power you've charged right up, jammed right up her for $250 a megawatt hour. California's man-made blackouts began in June of 2000, before intermittent energy sources, such as wind power, had any meaningful presence. Back then, almost all energy produced was of a reliable nature. There were no questions about clouds in the sky or how windy it was across the state. There was only a glaring discrepancy between generating capacity and lack of power. Even so, it took actual audio recordings of Enron traders joking about poor Grandma Millie before everyone could finally agree on what had happened, that no greater good had been served by skyrocketing energy prices and rolling blackouts. They weren't a necessary teething pain of deregulation or the kick in the pants needed to get more generating capacity built. Enron traders had deliberately constrained California's access to electricity and they got rich doing it. It took four years to achieve clarity on those blackouts. We might not be so lucky next time. Intermittent energy sources do not lend themselves to clarity. When the media talk about peak production capacity and don't mention capacity factor, that's not clarity. On the best day, they're doing pretty well midday, right? 
But on the worst day, in January, you got nothing. But this is what everybody forgets. As if the planet stops rotating, the clouds part, and Germany is baking in the sun, you know, because the sun shines on Germany 24 hours a day. Tom Friedman the other day in the New York Times brought up Germany as an example, saying that Germany is 30% wind and solar. Most self-described environmentalists believe that that chunk is entirely wind and solar. Wind and solar. When the media brands Germany's renewable program as one of solar and wind emitting biomass, that's not clarity. This is not the fault of solar and wind technology. They are very useful so long as we recognize and plan for their limitations. To fully harness intermittent power, we need both a smart grid and inexpensive energy storage. Today, we have neither, and I think it's very risky to presume we will get both. As we deploy renewables, increasingly, wind ends up losing to wind and solar ends up losing to solar. They deliver energy or fail to at the same time. The greater the solar and wind penetration, the steeper the peaks and troughs in supply. Here is a picture of a simulation of supply meeting demand. The year is 2010, so that is actual demand across the top line for 2010. The supply underneath has been modelled from renewable energy sources by Elliston, Diesendorf, McGill in order to demonstrate that it could be met using renewable sources only. With wind, this mountain type profile here is the coming and going of wind generation over this seven day period. The dark blue here represents solar PV. The yellow here is concentrating solar thermal with storage. Blue is the hydro, which leaves this fellow here. And that's biomass. Moving windmills apart helps. Energy storage helps. More transmission lines help. In the real world, we certainly do all these things. Wired Magazine, they're like, to get a new trunk line to San Francisco. They like went the opposite way, and they're like, is that far enough away from people? You know, it's longer and more transmission loss. The insanity of the NIMBY thing. It, we are not running a high power line through my neighborhood. I'll get electromagnetic radiation. Germany is a nation building transmission lines and storing energy and deploying renewables from one end of the country to the other. Despite all this, they burn more and more biomass every year and will miss their 2020 carbon emission target. If we're going to dismantle everything and replace it with something different, let's first make sure that different thing is better. Between 2010 and 2014, Germany switched 7% of their energy supply from nuclear power to renewables, with coal constantly supplying 43% of Germany's energy needs. Demnach kostet die Energiewende die deutschen Verbraucher pro Jahr insgesamt 28 Milliarden Euro. Because Germany has been paying 28 billion Euro every year to subsidize renewable energy, they were able to shut down half of their nuclear power plants without burning more coal. But Germany still had to burn stuff to replace nuclear. In fact, the single largest energy source in the German renewable portfolio is biomass. This biomass is called a renewable resource because it's not a fossil fuel and ultimately comes from plants which can be regrown. However, it is not an environmentally friendly source of power and it causes air pollution. In 2015, we exported over 5 million tons of wood pellets. That's in about five years. So talk about an explosion. They're clear cutting our wetland forests. We at Dogwood have worked to prove that. They're shipping it over to Europe and they're burning it in power stations. The same forests that we work so hard to protect, the same forests that provide all those benefits. Repeatedly in developed nations, a similar pattern unfolds. In 2011, California shut down San Onofre Nuclear Generation Station. Those opposed to nuclear power painted a picture of solar and wind replacing it. What ended up filling the gap was the combustion of natural gas. In 2014, the Vermont Yankee nuclear station was shut down. It was the fifth largest source of electricity for New England. It sure looks like the people trying to shut it down thought it would be replaced by renewables. Instead, it was replaced by burning oil and coal. Nuclear plants close, resulting in more combustion and more pollution. 
The only beneficiaries were those providing the alternate source of power. In the case of San Onofre, alternate sources of power were provided to California by its parent corporation, Edison International. In the case of Entergy's Vermont Yankee, alternate power was provided to New England by a natural gas power plant owned by Entergy Wholesale Commodities. While a nuclear plant is in operation, the utility pays into a decommissioning fund. This money cannot be touched until the plant is ready for retirement, or when it is taken into early retirement. The owner of the shuttered Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant have hundreds of millions of dollars stashed away for the decommissioning process. Today, federal regulators announced it can also use that money to deal with spent nuclear fuel. Closing Vermont Yankee released $665 million in decommissioning funds to the utility. Closing San Onofre will release over $4 billion. Pilgrim is next. A 690-megawatt reactor, it produces 14% of the electricity generated in Massachusetts. It has a summer capacity factor of 98%, making it a very reliable source of summertime electricity. There's no technical reason to shut down this source of pollution-free energy. However, the decommissioning fund contains $870 million. With me today, I have Jitter Shaw, who is the president of Generate Capital. He was the founder of Sun Edison. I'm not here to suggest that solar power should be powering the world, but I think both nuclear and solar and all these other zero-carbon fuels can be scaled up to meet the challenge. I have figured out how to get this right in solar and how to actually win the war. The nuclear guys haven't. They're just saying, if we just put the facts out, people will finally believe us. This is a political battle. And I'm happy to bring my lessons learned from the solar industry to the nuclear industry. But I think that this notion that we have a functioning nuclear power industry that has the ability to play the game is fanciful. There is a fairly straightforward way to save all those plants. But the nuclear industry has to actually pursue it. The guys who own Pilgrim aren't even trying to save it. It's everyone who doesn't own Pilgrim in the nuclear industry who's saying, oh, wouldn't it be nice to save Pilgrim? Most of the people that you hear are not the nuclear industry. They're people who are in favor of nuclear technologies. And I know that I don't garner many friends within the industry when I say this, but Entergy is perfectly happy to shut down Pilgrim, and so are Entergy's friends because they all perceive that right now there's an oversupply of electricity. They'll shut down their nuclear plants, and people say, well, how can they do that? And then, of course, the answer is that all of them have decommissioning funds already put aside, so they'll come out looking fine on their balance sheet, and they'll drive the price of electricity up for all the rest of their generating plants. Given all the wind turbines being deployed, It is not intuitive that shutting down nuclear leads to more pollution and higher energy prices. California's energy crisis was a confusing mess, too, when you're stuck in the middle of it. It's called global preventive medicine. The Earth is the patient now, and we're all physicians to the patient. We're here to serve, and we can save the world. Close down all those reactors now with solar and wind and geothermal. Forget about all the data and the figures and stuff. Listen to your intuition and you'll know what you've got to do. Dr. Helen Caldicott has been featured by CNN, The New York Times, CBC, Democracy Now!, 60 Minutes, and C-SPAN. When Helen speaks, many people make contributions large and small to the organization. The last two chapters of this book are very exciting because they give you the prescription for survival. $5, $25, $100,000 to the Institute to support Helen and the work that she does ending the nuclear age. I don't say things that are inaccurate, otherwise I would be deregistered. I mean, doctors can't lie. The doctors have been told by the superiors not to tell patients that their symptoms are related to radiation. This is the biggest medical conspiracy and cover-up in the history of medicine, George. I don't think you could dismiss the UN Scientific Committee as being part of the nuclear industry. I don't think you can dismiss the very large amount of data on the 
Sorry, you're saying you would dismiss the UN Scientific Committee as being part of the nuclear industry? Yes, let me tell you, George. Well, then the mind yeah. boggles. Where does this end? If, the mind if, does if boggle. Them and the UN Scientific Committee and the IAEA and, I mean, who else is involved in this conspiracy? We need to know. I'm testifying at your Darlington hearing soon. What am I going to say? You're all fools. What do you think you're doing? I mean, you all need psychoanalysis. These are all the elements in a reactor. She's testified before multiple government panels on the safety of nuclear power. If we move to uh, renewables in a big way, yeah. but you would not be able to have the kind of power um, yes, you that, would. that we have now. Oh, yes, you I would. I do think that we'd have to... Yes, you would. To smelt aluminum or to make aluminum it requires huge amounts of energy. We've got to stop using aluminum cans. That's just crazy. And all this frozen food is just obscene too. We shouldn't be freezing food. When I was a kid, there was no frozen food. We did all right. You know, in the winter, it's so hot inside, you have to strip. The thermostat should be lowered. How many use paper towels in the kitchen? Yeah, you're allowed to use paper to wipe your bottoms. <laughs> That's all. I like living the way I live, and I, I live fairly modestly. We live in a small house. I drive an 18-year-old Saturn. <laughs> you know, so we're fairly frugal, but I'm still an American, so that means I use vast amounts of resources no matter how frugal I am. When you're in the plane, the hostess hands you a drink with a bloody bit of, you know, a tree beside it. I don't need that paper serviette. It just becomes more and more increasingly difficult uh, to, to cut out the real big things, to be honest with you. As you walk from room to room, turn off your lights. Uh, 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 uh. It's easy to turn off the lights and to uh, turn down the heat and or don't use the air conditioning at all. But then you quickly run into the idea that, you know, am I not going to fly to that conference? Uh, am I going to ride a bike to, you know, the grocery store? We've got to stop. Do not never, t never use it. You don't need all this electrical gadgetry. Turn them all off. Every time you walk into one of those doors and it goes zoo in front of you, that's powered by electricity. Cover the place with windmills. It's what we've got to do if we want to keep using electricity. Otherwise, we have to stop using electricity. And think about it. Mozart wrote by candlelight and so did Shakespeare. So the human race has lived for a very long time without electricity. We've lived and survived for three million years without electricity. Well, what's wrong with candlelight? That's right. That's right. Dr. Helen Caldicott's prescription of a candlelit future and how it resonates with her audience brings to mind a classic Penn and Teller demonstration of how receptive people can be to fear mongering. Can I get you guys to sign a petition? My what for? For uh, banning dihydrogen monoxide. Oh, yeah, I'll start there. Thank you very much. Our petition woman was getting signatures left and right. We're talking hundreds. It causes a lot of urination, um, vomiting. Yeah, I'm can even cause... with it. Oh, okay. That's dye, hydrogen, monoxide, water. Uh, this is a petition for dihydrogen monoxide. What it is is it's a chemical that is found now in reservoirs and in lakes. Pesticides, different kind of companies are using this. And she's not going to lie or even stretch the truth, not at all. She's just going to talk about what water is and what it does with the vocabulary and tone of environmental hysteria. It's styrofoam companies, nuclear, nuclear companies. And now when they use it in pesticides, when we're washing our fruit and things like that, it's not coming out. It causes excessive sweating, excessive urination. And it's in the grocery stores and in our baby's food and stuff like that. We don't know if they thought but they signed. There we are. If you saw a petition being circulated warning the dangers of dihydrogen monoxide, how would you alert the signees to its utter stupidity? Of course you'd just say, dihydrogen monoxide is water. That would end it right there. But what if you couldn't say that? This is crazy. You are sitting on top of a nuclear weapon. Because there is no common sense about what nuclear power is or isn't you can have the word nuclear without the word bomb. There's only decades of fear-mongering. Whatever they put this waste in, it's so hot, we'll start to disintegrate within 10 years. You could cite some health studies and statements made by experts in the lucrative field of dihydrogen monoxide. 
You want us to put water on the crops? Yes. Water. But you would be considered suspect. Just a shill for big dihydrogen monoxide. I think this might be Gatorade or something. I was just looking for some regular water. You mean like in the toilet? What for? No, just to, to, to drink. <laughs> Everyone knows the safe alternative is Brondo energy drink. Good for your body, great for growing crops. Today's discussion around nuclear power is a lot like trying to debunk such a petition without using the word water. Water, like out the toilet? Well, I mean, it doesn't have to be out of the toilet, but, but yeah, that's the idea. People are accustomed to decades of barely competitive nuclear power, accustomed to the message that nuclear waste is a lurking danger, and people have been convinced that a nuclear accident will kill more people than a single day's worth of fossil fuel air pollution. Sol solar, solar, not, not nuclear. nuclear. Sponsored by the Will Heat Institute. Yeah, no problem. Know. Yeah. You don't need a furnace, just have solar panels. This is the cynicism of the fossil fuel industry. When I've spoken to women's groups, none of them knew how bad coal was. They didn't know it killed people. If you add up all fossil fuel combustion in the United States, just from power plants, the fine particulates alone kill 13,000 people a year. WHO says only 56 people died at Chernobyl. However, the New York Academy of Science has translated 5,000 papers from Russian. The Chernobyl study done by the New York Academy of Sciences, a book called Chernobyl by the National Academy of Science, produced by the New York Academy of Sciences, according yeah. to the New York yeah. Academy of Science. In no sense did the New York Academy of Sciences commission this work, nor by its publication do we intend to independently validate claims made. The translated volume has not been peer-reviewed by the New York Academy of Sciences or by anyone else. Now, when the National Academy of Sciences put it out, there were pro-nuclear people who were very strong, probably sociopaths. They discredited it. George Monbiot once deferred to Caldecott on matters of nuclear power and radiation. After the Fukushima disaster and a discussion with Caldecott on Democracy Now!, the biggest medical to conspiracy and cover up, the cover -up of in the by history radiation. of medicine, George. Mombayat wrote, The anti nuclear movement to which I once belonged has misled the world about the impact of radiation on human health. The claims we made were ungrounded in science, unsupportable when challenged, and wildly wrong. We have done other people and ourselves a terrible disservice. Helen Caldicott, the world's foremost anti-nuclear campaigner, has made some striking statements about the dangers of radiation. I asked for sources. Caldicott's response has profoundly shaken me. None were scientific publications. None contained sources for the claims she'd made. George Monbiot published our email exchanges on The Guardian. How dare he? So stupid. That revolting little man said after Fukushima he's become pro-nuclear. He's either got a cerebral tumor or he's had a psychotic breakdown. That's my clinical diagnosis. I've listened to a lot of Caldecott while editing this video. Is he being paid? I do wonder. Something, something fishy's going on. She says more crazy things than I can possibly include without giving this video an R rating. In our town in Falmouth, there was a presentation made at another Unitarian meeting house. Yeah. And it convinced a lot of people in the audience that thorium was a, a safer alternative. Who presented that? Who? Two people who... From where? Well, they were both connected to the nuclear industry in one way or the other. But they were very convincing. Yeah, they're idiots. People. These people are mad. Now, let me tell you about thorium. To produce electricity, you have to... Reprocess, like melt the fuel, then make the fuel rods with uranium 233 and put them in a reactor. It's economically totally out of this question. So these men are mad. There's some sort of psychotic element in the nuclear industry to do with testosterone and hormone receptors in the brain and behaviour and se sex comes into it. All these men operate from their reptilian midbrains and use their left cortex to justify what their emotions want them to do and a lot of it's about testosterone i'm fed up with testosterone yeah!
E equals MC squared is a substitute probably for male, will I say it? Erection and ejaculation. Um, and they like it, and it's this sort of energy that really grabs them. What you're about to hear is the least crazy sounding thing Dr. Helen Caldicott has ever said that people living near nuclear reactors are more likely to get leukemia. This is either a scary thing to hear, it causes excessive sweating, excessive urination, or a terrifying thing to hear, and it's in the grocery stores and in our baby's food, depending on whether or not you have children. Germany did a, a classic study of children under the age of five living less than 5k kilometers from 16 reactors. Their incidence of leukemia was more than double normal. That study was then duplicated by the French. So they don't need to do another study. The first one looked at leukemia rates among German children living within five kilometers of any operating nuclear reactor. Where 17 incidents of leukemia would have been expected, researchers instead found 37. The second study looked at leukemia rates among French children living within 5 kilometers of operating reactors. Where 7 cases of leukemia would have been expected, researchers instead found 14. In both studies, childhood leukemia rates very close to reactors are doubled. Also, in both studies, researchers strongly cautioned against assuming the increase in leukemia was from any sort of radioactive plant emission. How is it the researchers involved in both studies saw a doubling of leukemia rates near the reactors and then argue against any sort of radioactive plant emission as a cause? Wouldn't anyone like to know? And those two studies are classic studies. They don't need to do any more studies. QED, it's proven. Both the French and the German studies measured leukemia rates against distance from nuclear power plants. The French study followed the German one and so attempted to address some confounding factors that the German study lacked data for. The French study used two geographic models. One was simply distance to the reactor, as the German study had done. The second model incorporated wind direction to more closely model where any emissions from the reactor would be distributed. The excess cases of leukemia disappeared when using this more accurate weather model, meaning the vast majority of leukemia cases were not downwind from the reactors as one might expect. This curious finding was then explored further in a third study which saw elevated leukemia rates where nuclear power plants were planned but had not yet been constructed. There was not yet any radioactive material on those sites. So they don't need to do any more studies. It's proven. Nuclear power plants may be located close to cities and large population centers, but they're not dropped in the middle of housing units. Most frequently, in Europe and the UK, they're put in the industrial zones of small towns, on land previously used for other purposes. The German study's increase in leukemia rates were all clustered where a chemical factory had once operated and later the nuclear power plant had been built. So I don't need to do any more studies. The vast majority of scientific research finds no increase in cancer or leukemia is caused by nuclear power. Note again that researchers of both the German and French studies caution specifically against presuming that any emission from the nuclear power plants was the cause. So what does Caldicott do? She tells her audience that the reports are evidence of exactly that. We've lived and survived for three million years without electricity. We can laugh about her prescription of a candlelit future. We've got to stop. Do not, never, never use it. You don't need all this electrical gadgetry. Turn them all off. Television, DVD, oh, 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 oh. electric carving knives, all the flashing lights. But it comes at the end of a terrifying diatribe. These look like thalidomide babies. Do you remember when pregnant women took thalidomide? Between mischaracterizing good science and regurgitating bad science and just flat out making stuff up. This is the nuclear fallout released by the Australian Radiation Service. It's an absolutely wicked, wicked, wicked industry which kills people. These people should be tried like the Nazi war criminals were at Nuremberg. And I'm fed up with them.
It's not until you are scared out of your wits that she suggests we should switch from a clean source of lighting to one of the very dirtiest. If a woman who repeatedly tells audiences easily refutable falsehoods There must be a law that people can't lie. People should be sued. Doctors can't lie. We would be deregistered. I would be deregistered. If I lied about medicine, I would be deregistered. And they haven't sued me. So I'm right. If she can motivate people to protest nuclear power, then anyone can. Use sort of descriptive terminology that will get Mr. and Mrs. Joe Sixpack sitting at home watching The Simpsons and stuff. You know, that, oh my God, what about my children? Here's the argument for conventional nuclear power as heard by Joe Sixpack. This mysterious form of energy, which brings you feelings of distrust, if not outright fear, is in fact very safe. There's nothing to worry about here. The situation is under control. We plan to store nuclear waste in Yucca Mountain, even though it's perfectly safe in a dry cask. The waste was moved to cask storage from cooling pool, even though it was perfectly safe in the cooling pool. Fukushima radiation didn't kill a single person, despite everything you've heard. And utilities are shutting down nuclear reactors one after the other for non-safety related issues, despite all the money ratepayers spent to build them in the first place. I think this is an insurmountable communications challenge. There is a logical argument for conventional nuclear power, but it simply isn't enough to have an argument which makes logical sense. Not anymore. Not after 50 years of communications neglect. Up and at them. 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 Facts are not persuasive. They're not. The social science about this is really interesting. If you just present somebody with facts that are contradictory to their core beliefs, they actually become more beholden to those core beliefs. Murph is bright, but she's been having a little trouble lately. She brought this in to show the other students. Yeah, it's one of my old textbooks. It's an old federal textbook. We've replaced them with the corrected versions. Corrected? Explaining how the Apollo missions were fake to bankrupt the Soviet Union. Let's say you'd like to land a man on Mars. 6% of Americans think the moon landings were faked, and another 5% aren't sure. If you wanted to sway those 11%, how would you go about doing it? By arguing over shadows in the photos of Apollo 11? Or whether a nylon flag was flapping in a breeze? Stanley Kubrick was involved faking the Apollo moon landing. 2001 Space Odyssey was a research project for the Apollo footage that was shot. This is the biggest medical to conspiracy cover up the and cover-up in the by history radiation. of medicine, George. It would be more productive to talk about the existence of ice on Mars, how that ice can be split apart into oxygen and hydrogen and combined with carbon from the atmosphere to make rocket fuel. Avoid debating the contentious past, which implies an error in judgment. Instead, focus on shared goals and technological solutions not yet dismissed. Where does advanced nuclear ultimately take us? Is it more appealing than drill baby drill and wind baby wind? President Kennedy didn't challenge the nation to launch humans into orbit around the moon for a flyby. The challenge was, specifically, to land on the moon. That was the difference between Apollo 8 and Apollo 11. Britain, they have the crown jewels. In America, we have moon rocks. <laughs> and as they say, it is priceless. It is. It is priceless. And the fact we haven't gone back makes it more priceless. First landing was at the Sea of Tranquility, Apollo 11. That was chosen because it was very close to the equator. It was a very, they thought it was a very safe site. As Neil Armstrong was approaching the landing site, though, he noticed there were boulders everywhere. And I mean, they didn't have maps that showed him that kind of detail. And he had to take over from the computer with very little fuel left. And he really piloted his way down. I mean, it's one of those stories where, sometimes you hear stories, you go, oh, that was overplayed for dram dramatic uh, effect. effect. No. <laughs> On Apollo 11, the more you learn about what really happened, the more scared you get. You go, this guy was in big, big trouble, and he pulled it out by sheer wow. 
ability. He was one of the best pilots the United States had, and uh, and uh, he proved it that day on on landing on the moon. He he pulled he pulled the rabbit out of the hat. Apollo 11's touchdown was incredibly risky, and the slightest mistake would have resulted in Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin stranded on the moon, waiting to die. In 1962, one of these goals must have seemed far less audacious. In terms of driving technology forward, Apollo 8 would have been enough. Two major revolutions made the Saturn V possible and the moon landing possible. One was the decision to build a really big engine. It was a step change from what had come before. It is huge, over one million pounds of thrust far bigger than anything anyone had ever comprehended before. The other revolution, liquid hydrogen on the second and the third stages. Liquid hydrogen is a very efficient fuel and it makes the rocket lighter. Now we look at it and it looks huge, it looks giant, but you have to remember this was actually an extremely lightweight design compared to what could have been. Moving humans safely in and out of lunar orbit drove life support and propulsion research. The computing requirements alone helped kickstart the microchip revolution. This is called the J2 engine, and this was the other great breakthrough of the Apollo program, which was to use hydrogen as a rocket propellant. No one had ever done that before. If you could do it, the benefit was tremendous fuel efficiency. The downside was you were starting from square one. It's highly explosive, it's highly explosive and it's super cold, and it's challenging all kinds of materials that uh, are fine dealing with kerosene. You take 400 degrees below zero, they don't have a prayer. So they had to go with all kinds of new materials, new seals, new gaskets, new piping, new, everything was new to build the J-2 rocket. There was a part of Kennedy's speech I've always loved where he says, we will use new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented, capable of standing heat and stresses, several times more than have ever been experienced, fitted together with a precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communications, food, and survival, and then return it safely to Earth, re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, causing heat about half that on the temperature of the sun, almost as hot as it is here today, and do all this and do it right, and do it first. Before this dictate is out, then we must be bold. Just grab me a color. A color exterior. There you go. Yeah, I'm looking for one. C368. Anything, quick. We missed it. Hey, I've got it right here. Let me get up this one. A lot clearer. Apollo 8's lunar flyby produced Earthrise, the most influential environmental photograph ever taken. Apollo 8, an underappreciated Apollo mission. Most people never heard of it. Apollo 8, what's that? Excuse me, that was the first time anybody ever left Earth. There was Earth, seen not as the map maker would have you identify it. No, the countries were not color-coded with boundaries. We went to the moon and we discovered Earth. Apollo 8 was enough to change how we saw ourselves and spark an interest in science and engineering. Kids wanted to be astronauts long before we touched down on the moon. So why was the stated goal a risky Apollo 11 moon landing and not the more attainable Apollo 8 flyby? Because one could be articulated easily and leverage the nation's pop culture understanding of space travel. Apollo 8 was orbital mechanics and Delta V. Even today, Neil deGrasse Tyson is still explaining the difference between low Earth orbit and honest to goodness space textbooks, they have to fit the moon on the same page as the Earth. So you think moon is much closer than it actually is. Understanding what made Apollo 8 worthwhile was not a part of the culture. Apollo 11, that was stepping out onto an alien world. We got that. We'd read books about it, watched movies about it. You understood the implication the moment you heard it.
Atomic power used to be communicated in such simple, visionary terms. It held the public's imagination back when it was explained as a source of energy which would become too cheap to meter, just like a good internet data plan. And it's not disruptive to the existing energy paradigm, and this is a core motivation of the environmental movement, is that we don't just want to replace Peter with Paul. There's a romantic vocabulary that goes with renewable energy. Living in harmony with nature, it's safe, it's free, it's de democratic, it's localized. It has an overarching narrative to the renewable energy dream that's very attractive. We don't just want to replace fossil fuels with nuclear and have the same big centralized power plants and the same corporations. We want a revolution. We want to change the way the world works. Advocates for nuclear energy need to find that narrative, need to find that dream, need to have that positive overarching vision that goes beyond simply the technological aspect and saying, well, it's safe, you know, it's, or it's not that bad, <laughs> you know, it's not, it's, it's, not, it's not as dangerous as you think it is, right? But it's got to be something more than that. Put a great big power plant on the coast, bring in seawater from a couple miles out, desalinate it. Suddenly you're not even pulling water out of the aquifers anymore. So the river's not touched, the lake's not touched, the aquifer's not touched. And, and anybody see how big the Pacific is recently? <laughs> We have to get beyond burning stuff for energy, and we can go to a dispersed form of energy, which is gathering wind and solar, or we can go to a more concentrated form of energy, which is nuclear. And the disadvantage of wind and solar that will always exist is the amount of labor, energy, and expense of gathering and concentrating and directing that energy, because energy has to be collected and directed to do work. And nuclear energy has already been collected. Our national conversation on energy rarely mentions these concepts. Energy density. Energy reliability. If we continue to ignore energy density and reliability, we'll wind up in a future like this one. A future where we continue to solve problems through ingenuity and perseverance, but always with a disadvantage. We won't be using energy to tackle problems if we've constrained our own access to it. Human mechanical energy is so amazing. Why can't we use that to create energy? You will never run out of electricity. You never generate any pollution. So half the world is not gonna generate pollution. We call it free electric. Solar freaking roadway. Replaces all roadways, parking lots, sidewalks, driveways, tarmacs, bike paths, and outdoor recreation surfaces with smart microprocessing interlocking hexagonal solar units. Maintaining a nation of solar highways. Manufacturing bicycle battery generators for every home. An extremely ambitious idea to replace our nation's roads with solar panels. The Department of Transportation has kicked in $850,000. People are actually taking this seriously. Despite the media attention they've received, I think these ideas are flat out crazy. But they're par for the course in today's energy landscape. The Keystone XL pipeline extension. For a while, the entire national energy discussion revolved around a single pipeline. Sometimes, it seems, the more difficult an energy source is to harness, the more attention it receives. If you'll give me a chance to serve, I'll bring the EPA and the Agriculture Department and all the people together, and we'll use ethanol as a part of our nation's energy security future. For example, corn ethanol receives $7 billion in subsidy each year. Corn ethanol's return on energy investment is 1.3 times. Only 30% more energy is recovered from corn ethanol than went into producing it. Ethanol is a lousy molecule. I'm sorry, but the farm lobby did a really good job because they had a lot of money <laughs> to be able to peddle a really grossly inferior molecule like ethanol. It's got 25% less energy density per mole than regular old gasoline. And it costs a hell of a lot more money per liter to make. Even Al Gore, who was a key proponent of corn ethanol, acknowledges this subsidy was a mistake. The energy conversion ratios are 
at best, very small. How does corn's 1.3 times compare against other energy sources? Solar cells return 7 times. Natural gas is 10 times. Wind is 18 times. Today's water-cooled nuclear is 80 times. Coal is 80 times. Hydropower is 100 times. A thorium-powered molten salt reactor can return 2,000 times the energy invested in it. As another point of reference, the $7 billion wasted yearly on corn ethanol subsidies could triple NASA's entire technology development budget. All right, so this is the work that's actually going on at NRL today. This is not a theoretical possibility. The ocean, or rivers as it's pointed out, is full of carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Um, there's lots of this everywhere on the planet. In fact, seven-tenths of the Earth's surface is covered with water. We're looking at here at the electro electrolytic cation exchange module. This is on version three. Here's the skid that's used down at Naval, uh, Naval Air Station Key West. And what's going on is pretty simple. We're pumping electricity into this, this module up here. We're pulling carbonic acid, HCO3, out of the water. And by the way, per unit gallon, we're getting about a 92% removal from it. And then we're using standard electrolysis to crack water in order to make hydrogen. And what do you do with it? You string the carbon together with your hydrogen and let's get into the fuels business. Here is the spectrum for JP5, which is the standard fuel used to run all the aircraft, a bit like a classic bell curve. And what you're seeing is the spectrum based upon carbon content of the individual hydrocarbons as you make this guy out of oil. So this is, this is anybody, Exxon, BP, Shell, whoever you want to name it, pulling petroleum out of the ground, fractionally distilling it, and making JP5 according to the mill spec. So what happens coming out of our machine down at Naval Air Station Key West? Well, now look at this. We've got a decay curve. Because we're manufacturing the fuel synthetically, we're able to control the carbon content and get a better concentration of the C10 hydrocarbons that we want than you can get from natural oil. So what this turns out is that the synthetically made aviation fuel actually has a higher energy density and is cleaner. It doesn't have the sulfur compounds in it, it doesn't have the nitrates in it. All of the other really nasty stuff that comes out of burning a fossil fuel we don't have and we have a better power density profile, making this stuff artificially. If you do just basic high school chemistry, if we can get hydrogen and CO2 from seawater, you have the fundamental building blocks right there for making any hydrocarbon fuel you want. Burn the fuel, it'll go into the air, it'll get absorbed in the ocean, pulled out of the ocean, turned into the fuel, burned and back into the air. So you, your car works beautifully just as today, but it's not running on oil, but it's still running the same fuel you have today. It's not a real airplane, I admit it. However, you're looking at it in the air, flying, on fuel that was made from seawater and electricity. What do you do about civilian aviation? Are we gonna to move to a world where only the highest of our elected officials fly around the world and the rest of us get to walk? Because there is no substitute for aviation fuel if you wanna get in the air. We're not gonna have solar powered aircraft, we're not gonna have hydrogen fuel powered aircraft anytime soon. We're looking at some total radical technology breakthrough if you wanna fly. The hydrocarbic acid, in the ocean is in equilibrium with the CO2 in the atmosphere. It's a very simple test. Seal up a fish tank, fill salt water in the bottom, don't let any air into it. Run your probes in there, pull carbonic acid out of the bottom, read your CO2 level in the air above it, and watch the CO2 level in the atmosphere drop. Every time you take a piece of carbon out of the ocean, it is the same as taking it out of the atmosphere. It will pass from the air into the water. So when you send an aircraft up in the air and it's running on fuel you made by taking carbonic acid out of the ocean, you have a virtual carbon cycle. You are not adding CO2 at all. It's carbon free fuel that is carbon and burns in our existing engines. Electricity can be a byproduct of providing industrial process heat, a byproduct of desalinating seawater, a byproduct of reducing the lifespan of nuclear waste, and a byproduct of valuable fission products. 
This is an energy revolution to be driven by manufacturing, a need for clean water, and the anti-nuclear movement's own fear-mongering over spent fuel rods. Such a future isn't very hard to imagine, just as Kennedy could easily articulate broad mission parameters for Apollo 11 by saying, We choose to go to the moon! A future of energy abundance is already part of our pop culture. It's called Star Trek. First airing in 1966, it took the concept of abundant clean energy and ran with it. The thing I liked about Star Trek was that it gave you hope that there was going to be a positive future because it was taking place to you know 300 years in the future i mean at the time there were race riots that were going on in my town of cleveland strife and pollution and here you had this civilization that was really healthy it was exciting and they were pretty much at peace do you inherently become a better society just because you have access to a more advanced form of energy i've read some of gene roddenberry's writings and some of the other writers and their feelings when they were doing the show yeah they were talking about dilithium crystals and warp drive for the starships, but basically it was a nuclear-powered society. And that's how we were able to become peaceful and live with each other and be able to develop a civilization. Miss Nichols, there's someone who wants to meet you. He's a great fan of yours. And I expected to turn around and see some young person, uh, and I turned around into the face of Dr. Martin Luther King. And he said, yes, I'm a big fan of yours. And I said, thank you very much. And of course, I'm leaving the show after this first year. And he said, you cannot. And I was taken aback. And uh, I, I, I beg your pardon. He said, don't you know who you are? Don't you know what you have? A character with dignity and beauty and intelligence, he said, your most important input is for everyone who doesn't look like us, who sees us for the first time as we should be seen, as equals, as equals. In peaceful exploration, Nichelle, you cannot leave. Every time mankind has been able to access a new source of energy, it has led to profound societal implications. You know, the Industrial Revolution and the ability to use uh, uh, chemical fuels was what finally did in slavery. You know, people, um, human beings have had slaves for thousands and thousands of years. And when we learned how to make carbon our slave instead of other human beings, we started to learn how to be able to be civilized people and how to uh, uh, use machines to do what we need to do instead of make other people do it. Based on a utopian future of the 60s, this was where some of us were convinced we were headed. Technical realizations we've made since then are pretty simple. Fusion is hard. Fission is easy. It can even happen in nature. It is hard to create a TV show about space exploration without breaking the rules of physics. The stars are just spaced too far apart. But manned exploration of our own solar system, permanent outposts on the moon and Mars, and sending a probe under the ice of Europa those are all doable with everyday fission of a non-water-cooled variety. Extract the water from the soils of Mars, separate the hydrogen and oxygen. We now have a supply of rocket fuel on Mars, a fill-in station, so you don't have to carry all your fuel with you. Two-liter bottle of water. Put a little bit of water in the bottom. Now try to balance it. And I couldn't because all the weight was really low. I couldn't maneuver it fast enough. Then he filled it all the way up. Now it was much heavier and it was much more unstable, but the center of gravity was higher. So yeah, I was totally able to balance it. The rocket's the same way. They're unstable, but you want it to be unstable in a particular kind of way. You want to be unstable in a way to where you can control it. I'm an aerospace engineer by training. I went to Georgia Tech, got my master's degree there. Now I spent 10 years working at NASA. This is the kind of community I was thinking of. It had all of the same needs as a community on Earth would have, but it had some very unique constraints. He grew up talking space, living space, it is fourth grade state report on Alabama because of the rocket center and even from our first date, I knew he was passionate about space. Harrison Schmidt was the first trained geologist 
and only trained geologist to go to the moon. So he was a guy who knew what the heck to look for. And so the scientific take was so vast, it almost eclipses all the other missions put together. During the Apollo era, you didn't need government programs trying to convince people that doing science and engineering was good for the country. It was self-evident. And even those not formally trained in technical fields embraced what those fields meant to the collective national future. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they're easy, but because they are hard. Who wants to be an aerospace engineer so that you can design a plane that's a few percent more fuel efficient that doesn't really work? Saying, who wants to be an aerospace engineer because we need a plane that will navigate the rarefied atmosphere of Mars? You're going to attract the very best of those students. And the solutions to that problem, in every case I've ever seen, have improved life back here on Earth. Zero and lift off of the Atlas V with Curiosity. It had like heat shields and then a, a hypersonic drogue chute. I, I said, this is not going to work. Retro rockets and then a hoist. It was some group Goldberg would have designed. An SUV-sized rover was plunked down on Mars. How confident were you that this whole sequence of landing devices would have worked? I wasn't confident at all. I was shitting bricks. It was scary. This lander has more than 10 times as much scientific instrumentation than anything we've sent so to the surface So it needs more power. Needs more power, as Kirk would say to Scotty. <laughs> well, the last one was solar. This one's got nukes. Wait, wait, and so you have a nuclear there. power plant on the rover? It's not a power plant. It's a power source. We're touchy about this, because when you use the nuclear word... One of the two verboten N-words. That's right, that's right. So, 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 so when we use that N-word, um, we, we, we try to speak carefully. And it's not like a nuclear power plant with the cooling towers and the turbines and all that. It's a bunch of plutonium that's given off heat, and we use that to generate electricity. So you found another thing to call it to not spook people when yeah. it's launched? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Apollo astronauts used plutonium RTG to power their science equipment. The Mars rover Curiosity is entirely powered by RTG. And it can run at night, it can run in any season, and it should be well, able to run. Well, the ones had solar panels, they can only run in the daytime. Oh. Couldn't you charge a battery and keep working at night? In the Martian winter, the amount of power goes down. If your solar panels get covered with dust, So the Martian winter, the sun to... is very low in the sky. Yeah. The Mars exploration rovers often found themselves short on power as dust settled on their solar panels. They were the only source of energy, and the Martian winter was approaching. The part of it that really breaks my heart is that we just didn't have power to drive anymore. Well, one of them did die because of the winter, because it one got- One of the two rovers. Yeah, if, if the power goes down enough so that you can't run the heaters at night, then you die. That already happened to one of our previous rovers. So uh, if you want to do a lot of science, you want a lot of power, a lot of instrumentation, you want to last a long time and be able to rove anywhere on Mars. And nukes. Exploring space requires energy. Energy to run experiments. Energy to scrub carbon dioxide from astronauts' oxygen supply. The carbon dioxide removal assembly uh, is being worked on today inside the Destiny Laboratory. A uh, short was seen in one of the heating elements, but you see Mike Barrett there. He put a filter in there that helps uh, keep the water pure. The system uses water because obviously water is made of hydrogen and oxygen. It uses electrolysis. Uh, which is passing an electrical current through that water to split the water into hydrogen and its oxygen. The hydrogen is dumped overboard. The oxygen is used to pump into the air uh, of the station for the crew members to breathe. You go to the moon and there's no oxygen atmosphere, there's no lakes of water or anything, so it really comes down to nuclear and solar power. Uh, they called it the N-word at NASA. They were saying, oh, we can't even talk about nuclear. It, and I said, how can we not talk about it? I mean, we have exactly two options for how to make power in space, and this is one of them, you know? Europa! Another Europa! 
a black and white picture of a ring of Jupiter. Okay. No. What? How do you didn't get a second? Why is the Earth round? Why isn't it square or any other shape? That's a good question. I like that question. It's a question I have asked myself. And the answer has to do with gravity. Carl Sagan was a member of Voyager's imaging team. And it was his idea that Voyager take one last picture. That's here. That's home. That's us. Every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species, on a mote of dust, suspended in a sunbeam. As we explore further from the sun, the utility of solar panels shrink to zero. To illustrate, imagine we can power a space mission orbiting the Earth with one solar panel. We'll call this solar panel the Earth Panel. If we use Earth Panel orbiting Venus instead of the Earth, we'll get almost twice as much electricity from it. Because orbiting closer to the Sun, more photons will be hitting the panel surface. The same Earth Panel orbiting Mercury will generate almost seven times as much electricity. Mercury is closer to the Sun, more photons hit the panel. But when we start moving away from the Sun, in Mars orbit, we only get half as much electricity. So to power an identical space mission, we now need two Earth panels. At Jupiter, where only 4% as many photons can hit Earth panel, we now need 27 Earth panels to power the mission. The distance between Earth and Sun is what's called an astronomical unit. Earth is one astronomical unit away from the Sun. Jupiter is only five astronomical units away from the Sun, but requires 27 times as many solar panels. The relationship is not linear, it's quadratic. At Saturn, 91 Earth panels. Uranus, Neptune. At Pluto, 1500 Earth panels are required to power the mission. Somewhere between Mars and Saturn, our mission became impractical. Clouds and haze completely hide the surface of Titan, Saturn's giant moon. Titan reminds me a little bit of home. Like Earth, it has an atmosphere that's mostly nitrogen, but it's four times denser. NASA's Cassini mission to Saturn pulled into orbit, dropped off of itself, a little probe? The probe Huygens descended down from the Cassini spacecraft and landed on Titan. Hidden beneath lies a weirdly familiar landscape. Titan has lots of water, but all of it is frozen hard as rock. In fact, the landscape and mountains are made mainly of water ice. On Titan, the seas and the rain are made not of water, but of methane and ethane. On Earth, those molecules form natural gas. On frigid Titan, they're liquid. There might be creatures that inhale hydrogen instead of oxygen and exhale methane instead of carbon dioxide. 
they might use acetylene instead of sugar as an energy source. How could we find out if such creatures rule a hidden empire beneath the oil dark waves? The probe Huygens landed in one spot. You know, it's a big moon. It's one of six moons bigger than Pluto, by the way. Uh, you know, what's the other side of the moon look like? The probe only had battery life for a couple of hours. We weren't there long enough to see how things change. Does it snow methane? So these long time baseline questions can't be answered by two hours worth of data. Cassini mission was launched in 1997, and Saturn is a long way away. It took seven years to get there. The Huygens probe launched from Cassini only operated two hours, but Cassini itself, powered by plutonium RTG, continues to study Saturn and her 62 moons. For how long can plutonium power a mission? How far from the sun can we explore? The sun is constantly shooting out streams of charged particles in all directions. This solar wind blows a vast magnetic bubble. It pushes out against the thin gas of interstellar space. Beyond the outer planets, our heliosphere, there's a border where one ends and the other begins. It turns out there was a massive eruption from the sun which eventually reached Voyager 1 in April of 2013. It caused the plasma around Voyager to vibrate or oscillate. By measuring that sound wave, we could measure the density of the plasma in an interstellar space, the space between the stars. The Voyagers move about 40,000 miles an hour. They gave us our first close-up look at Jupiter's great red spot, a hurricane three times the size of Earth. We can now make out finer detail on Jupiter than the largest telescopes on Earth have ever obtained. The cloud patterns are distinctive and gorgeous. Its motion hypnotizes us. Four days after the uh, Voyager 1 encounter with Jupiter, I was looking at an optical navigation frame. It became very evident to me it was an anomalous crescent in the upper left-hand corner just off the limb of Io, a volcanic plume and, in fact, a volcanic eruption. The Voyagers discovered the first active volcano on another world, on Jupiter's moon, Io. The Voyagers dared to fly across Saturn's rings and revealed that they were made of hundreds of thin bands of orbiting snowballs. Voyager successfully completed its mission of discovery to the outer planets, but its odyssey into the darkness was just beginning. 35 years after its launch, Voyager 1 became the first of our spacecraft to enter an uncharted realm. Until then, we didn't know where the interstellar ocean began. Compare the performance of Cassini, Voyagers, New Horizons, and the Curiosity Mars rover against solar and battery-powered exploration. The Mars rover Spirit froze to death thanks to dust on its solar panels. Huygens landed safely on the surface of Titan, but NASA only received two hours' worth of data. And most recently, the European Space Agency's 2014 achievement of landing a solar-powered probe named Philae on Comet 67P. Humanity landed a probe on a comet whose path spans both Earth's orbit and Jupiter's. Every six years, 67P nears the Sun, warms up, and ejects material from its core through vents on its surface. Every six years, 67P freezes once again as it drifts out towards Jupiter. Solar-powered fillet was never designed to survive a full orbit. But, in our orbit study, an appropriate challenge for solar panels hit a snag. The landing produced some surprises. Philae didn't secure itself to the comet's surface and bounced, making multiple touchdowns. 
The final resting site was partly in shadow, receiving less sunlight to recharge its instruments. Filet was power-starved and unable to conduct experiments before freezing to death. Hours of operation? Decades of operation. Neil deGrasse Tyson is a tireless advocate for NASA, explaining to politicians and public what we miss when space exploration is severely financially constrained. We lost an entire generation of these smart people. They became like investment bankers or lawyers out of the 1980s and 90s because there's no place for them to take their interest in science. When the merger between Boeing and Lockheed's business occurred, the merger promised in the press release $150 million of savings. Instead, there were billions of dollars of cost overruns. And entrepreneur Elon Musk explains how space exploration is launch-constrained. Musk created SpaceX to drastically reduce the cost of launching payload into orbit. SpaceX was, was founded to make radical improvements to space transport technology, uh, with particular regard to reliability, safety, and, and affordability. We have top men working on it right now. Who? Top. Men. But what about powering space exploration? Most of our RTG fuel, the plutonium-238, was created a quarter century ago. NASA started producing more in 2013, but the worldwide shortage of RTG fuel is a perpetual constraint on space missions. And while our tiny supply of plutonium-238 can power exploration missions lasting decades anywhere in our solar system, the radioactive decay of plutonium really does not provide much power. Curiosity runs on 100 watts. Rolling across the surface of Mars, taking photos, grinding samples, detecting neutrons, monitoring the atmosphere, and sending all this data back to us, Curiosity does all this on two incandescent light bulbs worth of power. Our space missions will never match what we see in movies or read about in science fiction novels. This is an invisible constraint. The Martian is based on Mars Direct, a research paper written by NASA engineers. That the weight of the rocket fuel required for a round trip to Mars was so enormous it would render the launch ship possibly heavy. We would split the mission up into two parts and we'd send the return vehicle out first with its own return propellant plant. So the propellant would be made on Mars. Before any humans land on the planet, Mars Direct uses a small unmanned nuclear reactor on wheels to power the creation of rocket fuel so that humans can get from the surface of Mars back up into space. Uh, it is oh six fifty three on Sol nineteen, and I'm alive, obviously. But I'm guessing that's going to come as a surprise to my crewmates. That a starving astronaut's journey across Mars consists of repeatedly deploying solar panels, sleeping during the day while his vehicle recharges, and then driving at night is a realistic but unnecessary challenge created for dramatic tension. Had Mark Watney been abandoned during a Mars Direct mission, he'd have ample electricity to journey across Mars thanks to the small nuclear reactor on wheels he could tow behind his rover. Okay, it's not a giant nuclear power plant that powers a city, it's just a nice little putt-putt nuke sitting in the back of a truck. Look, I mean, I don't mean to sound arrogant or anything, but I am the greatest botanist on this planet. Similarly, Mark Watney rations his potato crop to survive 400 days on Mars. I now have 400 healthy potato plants. I dug them up, being careful to leave their plants alive. The smaller ones I'll reseed, the larger ones are my food supply. The carbon in Watney's potato crop tissue does not come from nutrient-rich astronaut poop. It comes from the carbon in the Martian atmosphere. Photosynthesis is carbon dioxide, plus photons creating plant tissue and emitting oxygen. Because there's no shortage of carbon or water on Mars, more photons means more potato. 
artificial lighting means bigger potatoes than could otherwise be grown in Mars orbit. It's the difference between one half of Earth sunlight and as many photons as the potato crop can absorb. Hey, watch him. Oh my God, El Dorado. The legends are true. That is how illegal grow operations are routinely busted, simply by monitoring unusual behavior on the electrical grid. This is also why high-yield urban farming requires so much energy. You want to see what minimal calorie count looks like? It has been seven days since I ran out of ketchup. Andy Weir put his astronaut on the brink of freezing to death and starving to death by downgrading the Mars Direct nuclear reactor to an RTG. Even so, nuclear power of some sort was still required, as the author explains. At one point I considered, when he's on his long drive to uh, Schiaparelli, I thought, what if the RTG develops a problem? What if it leaks or something like that and he has to live without it? And so he like, throws it away and oh. he has to drive away without it. And there's just no way you survive. <laughs> really? Just, you are dead. Well, Mars actually has a huge amount of water and water ice, so I don't think we'll really uh, suffer a, a water so shortage in Mars. The main thing about Mars is actually going to be energy. Um, if you have energy, there's plenty of water because there's, there's massive amounts of ice. Uh, so it's really just about um, getting huge numbers of uh, uh, solar panels out there. And I think assuming the public is receptive, we, you know, there might be nuclear. I think certainly if you build nuclear on Mars, as to whether you transport nuclear to Mars would be you know, kind of up, up, up to the public to decide. When you see a futuristic and inspiring space mission on the big screen, it's not being powered by RTG or solar. Well, what if NASA missions had access to far more energy? Most people don't appreciate how little energy NASA has at their disposal to design missions around. The most exciting missions are not even under consideration because we have no way to power them. We've got one liquid water planet in our solar system and we've already identified three potential hydrospheres yeah. that are ice covered and far, far from the sun. Right. But so based on our own immediate experience, it's a three to one ratio. Sure, sure. Um, do we know if any of them are habitable? No, we don't, but we gotta go look. A mission to explore under the ice of Europa would be the ultimate robotic challenge. Solar is out of the question. Jupiter is too far from the sun and batteries can't hold enough power to melt through a planet's outer shell of ice. We need something small, lightweight, long-lasting, and extremely energy dense to power such a mission. Can I just give my favorite mission, which doesn't exist and isn't funded now? It would be to go to Jupiter's moon Europa, yeah. Yeah. which has an icy yeah, outer agree. surface. The gravitational stress on Europa from Jupiter and other surrounding moons is pumping energy into it, much the same way when you warm up a racquetball by hitting it. You distort it, it bounces back to shape, you're pumping energy into it. That has melted the interior ice. It has had an ocean of liquid water that's been liquid for billions of years. And every place on Earth we find liquid water, we have found life. I want to go ice fishing on Europa. Yeah. Lower submersible. Airspace is freaking cool, man. It's awesome to work on rockets and spaceships and everything. I love it. It's like in my guts. I love it. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. This was uh, O'Neill's vision back in the 70s. We all knew we needed energy, and solar energy sure seemed great. And this like really affected the way I thought. I was like, yeah. Sign me up for this. There's no coal on the moon. There's no petroleum. There's no wind either. And solar power had a real problem. I worked a lot of my career in solar power systems. It's just that, that said, I'm, I'm a lot more aware of their limitations. The moon orbits the Earth once a month. For two weeks, the sun goes down and your solar panels don't make any energy. Back on Earth, Star Trek features high-density human population unspoiled nature, access to ridiculous amounts of energy, and apparently no resource constraints worth fighting over. Give me a martini straight up with uh, two olives for the vitamins. 
Gene Roddenberry had a vision of the future where mankind had overcome many of his problems and desired nothing more than a peaceful quest for knowledge. Must be kind of boring, ain't it? A lot has changed in the past 300 years. We have eliminated hunger, want. Then what's the challenge? The challenge is to improve yourself, to enrich yourself. Is this vision of prosperity and nature as doable as sticking a nuclear reactor on a probe and melting through ice? I've said this many times, I want to go ice fishing on Europa. It has had an ocean of liquid water that's been liquid for billions of years, and every place on Earth we find liquid water, we have found life. I want to go ice fishing on Europa. <laughs> Lower submersible. So is this doable? Is an ecologically sound Earth compatible with 8 billion people living healthy, dignified lives, chasing their full human potential. Or is this just another fantasy component of Star Trek, like warp drive and teleportation? We're going to exhaust every option until we finally get clear that actually what matters is making clean energy cheap, so that we can live in a world where we mostly live in cities, we have high-intensive agriculture, we've got clean energy, we've got clean water, you know, we've got recycling your materials, that's a vision of a world where we can all live modern lives, and it does not, uh, it's not, it does not require any, uh, does not require any science fiction. Human beings have done amazingly well over the last half century. In 1950, there were just two and a half billion people on Earth. Today, there's more than seven billion of us. Everywhere, infant mortality has been going down, and almost everywhere, people are living longer lives. Unfortunately, all of our success has come at a high cost to the natural world. The number of wild animals on planet Earth has declined by half since 1970. It seems like we're always using nature in some ways, but humans save nature by not using it. It's the part of the earth that we don't use that we leave to wild nature. Humans use about half of the earth, half of the land surface of the earth, the part of the earth that's not underwater or under glaciers. Of that half, about half of the human impact is meat, or 24% of the Earth's surface. Another 10% is crops. Another 9% or so is for wood production. And this is really amazing. 3% of the Earth's surface we use for cities and suburbs, for the places that we live. And what's important about that is that now half of all humans, three and a half billion of us, live in cities and suburbs. And this is gonna to prove to be a crucial part of how negative impact will peak and decline this century. If we take the right actions today, the overall size of the human population and our overall negative impact on the natural world could peak and decline, not by the end of the century, but within a few decades. Many of you know that whaling was a huge industry in the early 1800s. Mostly we hunted whales for their oil. We used their oil as energy to light up our lamps. Grand ball given by the whales in honor of the discovery of oil wells in Pennsylvania. We save nature by not using it. We saved nature by not needing it. We didn't need the whales anymore. We had a better substitute. It was kerosene made from abundant and cheap petroleum. And we didn't save the whales by using whales more sustainably. We didn't save the whales by having more efficient lighting to burn the whale oil more efficiently. We saved the whales by not hunting them. This is New England in 1880. There was only 30% of it forested at that time. Most of the rest was farmland. This is New England today, 80% forested. Martha's Vineyard was really a large sheep farm in 1900. Today, it's mostly forested. The forests are growing back, why? Farms went bankrupt. We mostly didn't need them for their land anymore. We became more efficient at growing more food. We grew more food on less land. We saved 
all of that nature, allowing the forest to grow back because we didn't need it. Look at this beautiful green forest that surrounds Hong Kong. Hong Kong is only able to save that beautiful nature because it doesn't need it for growing food or for using it for energy. And they've made an incredible city and people you know, worry, they say, well, if you go to the city, you're alienated from nature. But look, they can walk into nature from Hong Kong. Nature's right there. That sounds nice for Hong Kong, but what about poor countries? What about developing countries? What about all the slums? And we're talking about industrialization, about factories where the conditions are terrible and people are treated miserably. That was certainly my view. 20 years ago, I was involved in an effort to hold Nike and other corporations accountable for their labor practices in other countries, particularly in Indonesia. It was a successful effort and Nike did make some improvements, but 20 years later, I wanted to go back. I wanted to see what had happened to the workers. Had their lives really improved materially? And I met this young woman, her name is Suparti. She makes four times more money than the people back in the village farming rice. We're growing much more food on much smaller amounts of land. It's one of humankind's most extraordinary achievements with great benefit to the natural world. We use half as much land per person globally to provide our food. It's only possible for Suparti to live in the city as long as she doesn't need to make her own food and we're making more food for more of us. In the countryside, when you're a poor farmer, you need a lot of kids to help you work on the farm. You need a lot of kids to help you in your retirement. In the city, you can invest more in fewer kids. And that trend is consistent around the world. As women become more powerful, more educated, as they have more income, her grandmother had 13 children, her mother had six, and you can see it right here. We don't know what's gonna happen next. There's one scenario where we keep going up, another scenario we go down. The high population estimate, the estimate where the world goes to 16 billion or more by the end of the century, is a world of low energy, wood energy, wood, dung, and charcoal, and large families, mostly in the countryside. A world where the population peaks at eight and a half billion and then declines by the end of this century is a world like Suparti is living. Higher energy, smaller families, more development, and more opportunity. This is Maisha. She is one of the 900 remaining mountain gorillas left in the world. She, as a baby, grew up in Africa's oldest national park in the Congo, called Virunga. In 2007, her parents and much of the rest of her group were killed by men making charcoal for energy. Since then, there's been well-meaning efforts to plant trees, to help people in the region burn wood more efficiently, and the situation has only gotten worse. When we visited in December of last year, this is an aerial photo that we took high above the park. You can see here, 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 illegal charcoal burning in the park. Why? Because people need it. Over 90% of the people depend on wood for fuel. We didn't save the whales by using whales more sustainably, by using whale oil more efficiently. We saved the whales by using a different kind of energy, by using a substitute. Suparti uses propane. What we use is camping fuel, similar to the natural gas that we all enjoy. It's an important substitute for the three billion people that still depend on wood and dung. As more of us move to the cities, we're gonna consume more energy. For everybody to live at a moderate living standard, at basic material needs met, the world is going to need to triple and perhaps quadruple the amount of energy it produces from today. Propane is a fossil fuel. What are the clean energy options? There's not many. There's solar, there's wind, there's a little bit of geothermal, there's hydroelectric dams, and there's nuclear power plants. And solar and wind are wonderful. I've spent much of my professional career advocating for more solar, for more wind, including wind farm off the coast of Cape Cod. But solar and wind alone cannot power Shanghai at night. And there's a lot of exciting developments in batteries, but we are so far away from being able to power cities on batteries. Geothermal is great where it's available, and it's not available in many places. Hydroelectric dams have mostly been built in the rich world. We've mostly dammed our rivers, and even in places like China, many of the rivers have already been dammed. That means that we have to take a second look at nuclear power. When I was a boy, my aunt took me every August to Bittersweet Park where we would remember the Hiroshima bombings. We would light candles and put them on paper boats. I saw a television movie about the aftermath of nuclear war. 
I was anti-nuclear my entire life. A million people dying right now or have died because of Chernobyl. You know, you, I, I found myself quite disappointed in myself and, and honestly quite angry at others who were propagating that myth. More people have died from Chernobyl than in the Black Plague. Fear is a really important emotion, but if we allow fear to drive us, we can end up making decisions that actually put us at greater risk. What's so striking is just to go read the original World Health Organization documents and read the public health reports. It was a complete shock to me. I mean, I'm reading all the Chernobyl stuff and I, I, I'm, I kind of am not believing it because it was so out of sync with what I had come to believe. The biggest medical to conspiracy and cover up, the cover -up of in the by history radiation. of medicine, George. In order to believe that a million people were killed by Chernobyl, which is what Greenpeace and Helen Caldicott, a number of other people claim, you have to believe there was a cover up of just massive proportions by the World Health Organization, by the United Nations, by literally hundreds of the world's top public health experts. Close down all those reactors now with solar and wind and geothermal. Forget about all the data and the figures and stuff. Listen to your intuition and you'll know what you've got to do. And then I confronted this data and the challenge of meeting global energy and development needs and also dealing with one of our most serious environmental problems. And I've changed my mind. On top of that rock, there must be 500 sea lions on top of that rock right now. This is a nuclear power plant in California. You can see here all around it, natural life, sea life exists because nuclear power is zero pollution. And one of the things we've learned about energy production is that what you want from an environmental perspective is that you want the least natural resource in, the least amount of fuel in, the most amount of energy out, and the least amount of pollution and waste. You can't walk alongside a coal plant and not be affected by the smoke. You can with nuclear. How do humans save nature? Moving people out of their dependence on wood and agrarian poverty, moving away from large families to medium-sized families, access to modern energy so that forests are spared, so that forests can grow back from agriculture. The final step, moving towards small families, universal prosperity, and nuclear energy. Today we use half of the earth for nature. Can we leave 75% for nature? We're gonna need more land for cities, but given current trends, higher energy, smaller families, more development and more opportunity. We can drastically reduce how much of the earth we use for wood, crops, and meat production. Can we do it? I think we can. Why am I so confident? Because we've done it before. Thank you very much. What you see behind you are real environmentalists. We're not caught in some dogma from 40 years ago, and that's why they placed the goal of beating climate change above the goal of building a bunch of solar and wind. Today, the case for nuclear is being made by environmentalists, engineers, scientists, and specifically, climatologists. I thought nuclear power was dumb. And I was an anti-nuclear campaigner. I found out that it is a zero carbon power source. I thought the opposite. I was wrong. I used to be strongly opposed to nuclear power. I was appalled by it. Well, um, nuclear power was evil. I didn't want to go there. I do have empathy for the people who disagree with me because I was that person. People who once opposed nuclear power are the ones speaking the loudest and the clearest. I understand where you're coming from because I went through the same process. You can reach people. And their message is resonating. On opening night, I polled the audience and I asked the same question after the film, and that was the response. Common Sense says, oh, I'm Robert Stone, I'm the director of Pandora's Promise. Explaining the value of nuclear power shouldn't be this easy. If it was, the industry would have done it already. Have you received any funding uh, from the nuclear industry at all? No, absolutely not. But the nuclear industry is not properly incentivized to solve obvious problems like explaining what fission is to the public. I would be a complete idiot to have ever taken a dime from the nuclear industry or anybody associated with the nuclear industry. It's an industry that's forgotten to sell its product. And no other industry acts that way. 
you know, there are, there are warm and cosy natural gas advertisements on TV all year long encouraging me to buy their product. Airlines, you know, show you pictures of people on beaches. Part of the anti-nuclear narrative is the big bad nuclear industry. Doctors can't lie. We would be deregistered. I would be deregistered. I would be deregistered. I would be deregistered. And they haven't sued me. And they haven't sued me. So I'm right. However, in my experience in advocacy and outreach, actually standing up for yourself and being proud of what you do tends to work quite well. Making it clear that nuclear power is carbon-free energy. Nuclear power is essentially carbon-free energy. Or even addressing people's concerns about fuel rods. For example, nuclear power plants have been paying into a DOE nuclear waste fund for 35 years. Permanently housing nuclear waste was not the responsibility of utilities or the nuclear industry. It was the responsibility of the Department of Energy. Nuclear plants paid into the waste storage fund based on how much energy the reactors produced, not how much waste they produced. That's like trying to reduce pollution by paying a headcount carpool tax instead of a per gallon gasoline tax. How effective in fighting pollution would a carpool tax be? There's no nuclear industry incentive for addressing the public's fear. No incentive to communicate that solutions even exist. Instead, put nuclear plants into early retirement and free up the billions locked away in their decommissioning funds. Such perverse incentives have turned an industry once capable of crystal clear communication into the punching bag of fake environmentalists. Nuclear power produces a substantial amount of global warming gas. Nuclear power produces massive quantities of global warming gas. In fact, a nuclear power plant will produce the same amount of CO2 in total as a gas fire plant, so you may as well just use gas. Carbon footprint of nuclear is much higher than wind and solar. Everything pales in comparison to nuclear. <laughs> if the industry wants to correct misinformation directly, they can do it. Up and at them. Up and at them. That is a hundred million dollar communications challenge. Up and at them. Up and at them. For a multi-billion dollar industry. Up and at them. Up and at them. They haven't sued me, so I'm right. Anti-nuclear groups, the thing they most attack most vociferously, if you see the, t the attacks against my film, it's about the fourth generation stuff. It's like, this is bullshit, it doesn't exist, it's all exaggerated, it's all problems, it's like, they've built, tried this for years, it's always been a disaster, they go after that because it's the most effective deconstruction of all of the things that we object to nuclear power. Helping people identify exactly which component of existing nuclear technology is responsible for their concern and how we can build something better than what they fear speaks to everyone's faith in our ability to solve problems. Talking about advanced nuclear is not doing the same thing and expecting a different result. It is a new approach driven by people outside the conventional nuclear industry and we're finding that it works. We're all part of this broader movement that's changing the way people perceive nuclear technology, that's redefining what nuclear power can be. I, I've been in, I think in a five minute conversation, I can open somebody's mind and, and talking about next generation reactors is the way to do it. Some folks can start off simultaneously opposed to nuclear power and advocates of thorium energy. This contradiction sorts itself out the moment they start fact-checking a Caldecott. The hearing of the Subcommittee on Energy will come to order. Numerous engineers of, who are uh, renowned engineers, people who know what they're doing, tell me that there are a number of approaches that would eliminate the leftover waste problem. Uh, but every time I hear about coming back with what will be built, again, it's light water reactors. I don't understand how what's going on here. Why are we spending money to build reactors based on the same concept that we have been building all ever since uh, World War II? I believe that the light water reactors for the foreseeable future will be a bridge between the industry of today 
and an industry of tomorrow. What we've got is not a bridge to tomorrow, but a, but a protection of the status quo. My constituents were always asking me about this. Does thorium have a place in our nuclear future? Given that we have made a massive commitment in this country to a uranium-based cycle, I see no compelling reason to move towards a thorium cycle. I started learning myself when I stumbled upon some Google Tech Talks in 2009. Casually, part-time, for the next two years of my life, I tried to figure out why molten salt reactors were a dumb idea. Eventually, I realized not only were molten salt reactors a pretty good idea, but nuclear power itself was nothing like I'd imagined. To anyone concerned about the environment, poverty, exploration, or just untapped human potential, this stuff is inherently compelling. People are drawn to it, just like every other source of clean energy. I'm a huge advocate of geothermal energy and also a sort of long-standing environmentalist and was very against nuclear till quite recently when I started to realize that all of renewable energy in the world doesn't even come close to stacking up to our energy demand. Then the final tipping point for me was actually, you know, the opera singers sang about thorium reactors and I was like, wow, these people care a lot about nuclear energy. There must be something behind that. We could have far more clean energy. We can have next generation nuclear, uh, thorium reactors that have no risk of meltdown. The energy department are just committed to regulating existing nuclear. There's next generation nuclear, thorium reactors. That could be uh, encouraged and market-based American solutions that clean the air reduce emissions and grow jobs and make us a more secure country. Thorium has the potential to make nuclear energy much safer and more efficient. I think it's natural to re-examine your beliefs as you age up. Nuclear is the best way to go for energy for the future. You and I are religious fanatics or have been about anti-nuclear. Nuclear is bad. And we are the ones in who should lead the discussion. I remember the intensity of the nuclear debate, and I was on the other side of it. This administration does not support the Department of Energy's Advanced Liquid Metal Reactor Program and will oppose any efforts to continue the funding for this reactor project. But given this challenge we face today, and given the progress of fourth generation nuclear, go for it. No other alternative, zero emissions. We all know that there isn't four hours of sun here in Michigan every day, and so on those days there's no sun. How am I warming up my pizza? <laughs> You don't have to explain what the promise of abundant clean energy means. Everyone understands this concept. We're just introducing a very real technology that can actually deliver. Calls to action. Calls to action. If you're at the age of 15 to 19, consider becoming a nuclear, chemical, electrical, or mechanical engineer. If you are from the ages of 20 to 25 and are not one of the aforementioned majors, consider going back to school. <laughs>